Chapter 67. Hidden Dream Part 1. Nightmare. Over the course of the next month, Teams 9 and 5 pick up as many DNC rank missions as they can, aiming to get as much experience as they possibly can. Where previously D-Ranks were seen as meaningless chores and busy work, they're actually now a welcome part of the work schedule. In between the high-ranked escort missions, guard duty, or monster subjugation, picking up litter is actually a breath of fresh air. For one, they're actually recognized by the people they encounter more often on their D-Rank missions, and while it's nowhere near the fame Naruto-sensei has, it's kind of nice to have your work acknowledged and appreciated. People wave to them, call out their names, even gift them something minor things like baked goods or apples. Katori and Kashiwama's now official race, while tiresome at first, did eventually catch on to the others, and they started more actively engaging in which team would perform their missions better. Naruto and Shino note both the positives and negatives of this little competition, as it can lead to recklessness and rushing, but it also motivates them to strive harder. With care from the sensei, the negatives were ironed out. Hakage's Tower For their next missions, both teams are actually taking their assignment directly from the 5th Hakage, rather than the mission assignment desk. Sonata sits behind her desk with Shizuna by her side, pressing two scrolls on the desk in front of her. Naruto and Shino stand directly in front of her and their teams by their respective sides. Except for Katori and Kashiwama who are clinging to the desk. Is it a good one? Katori hops in place as she looks her adoptive grandmother with pleading eyes. Give us the better mission. Kashiwama urges his cousin. Sonata sighs and flicks both of them on the forehead. Get back to your places, you two. You're in the Hakage's office. You need to learn exactly what that means. Naruto chuckles and pulls Katori to his side, while Kashiwama walks back in defeat. Your next missions will be of a diplomatic nature, to speak to two potential new members of the Shinobi Union. Team 5, you're to go to the Hidden Moon Village and Team 9, you're to go to the Hidden Dreams Village. She hands them each a scroll. Shino takes his while raising a quizzical brow. Negotiations for the Union. Is that not something better suited for those more involved in its structure, such as Hinata? The intent behind sending a team of Genin is to also serve as an exchange in experience, show them how our future shinobi are being trained, and how the future is in safe hands. Team 5 is among the elite, so they're a good pick to showcase the hidden leaf. Sonata explains. Kashiwama puffs out his chest with pride. Elite, huh? I guess that's not wrong. Be mindful, Kashiwama. Shino warns. After all, confidence and arrogance are closely related. Yeah, well, we're being sent out, too, you know. Katori crosses her arms. So that means we're also elite, right? Your assignment is more unique. Typically the founding members are to send out a team to potential members to negotiate, and the Hidden Leaf is sending Team 5. The Hidden Dreams, however, specifically request you, Naruto, so your team is going there. Me? Naruto raises a brow. Why me? I've never even heard of the Hidden Dreams village, honestly. Shoto scratches his head. I don't recall learning about it, either. Sonata shrugs. It is what it is. Maybe they just want to see the hero himself. Like the Hidden Star Village, they've been very secretive and secluded, and like the Hidden Star, they've never really participated in any conflicts. For them to want to come out of the woodworks is a big deal, so don't mess it up. I won't let you down, Granny. Naruto declares. If it's a hero they want, then it's a hero they'll get. He pumps his fist. Shizuna giggles. You say that, but you always get flustered when fans hound you. Naruto turns beet red. You don't have to say it like that. He protests. So, um, Yakamaru interrupts, much to Naruto's delight, why is it called the hidden dreams? How do you hide in a dream? Then again, how do you hide in a moon? Kashiwama scratches his head. It's called the hidden dreams because of the surrounding forest, which is filled with a thick miasma that puts you under a heavy genjutsu. The locals know how to come and go, so you'll be met by Dreams Ninja before you enter the forest. Got it. Naruto nods. Sonata then turns to Shino. Any questions about the Hidden Moon? Shino shakes his head. I'm familiar enough with it. Your mission details are all in the scroll. You leave tomorrow. Sonata gives them a final confirming look. The teams bow and take their leave, not having any further questions. As soon as the door closes, Katori pumps her fist and turns to Kashiwama. You better get ready, cause we're gonna diplomacy this mission so hard. We're gonna get all diplomatic. She trails off with a sigh. How do we make this challenge even work? You could, you know, not, Gen's eye shrugs. Too boring. Katori waves him off. Naruto pats her on the head. We talked about this. 
We gotta put the hidden dream village first, before any competition you guys have. We gotta show them our best side. I wish you success on your mission. Shino says. With the expansion of the Shinobi Union four years ago, this is the next important step in a peaceful world. You're right. Naruto nods. I didn't think it was possible for this many villages to collaborate, but it's been working out so far, right? And representatives like Hinata are why we're doing good. When we meet up after our missions, we can welcome the moon and dream into our ranks. He grins and holds out his fist to Shino. Shino looks it over inquisitively and ultimately fist bumps him with some hesitation. See, isn't that cool to do? Hmm. Shino thinks it over. I suppose it does offer some semblance of closeness and understanding. Um, yeah. Naruto scratches his head. It's also just cool to do. As they leave the building, Naruto cracks his knuckles. All right, Team 9, go and get some rest. We got a bit of a travel ahead of us. You do your best, too. Team 5, we'll do way more than our best. Kashiwama declares. I'm pretty sure that's grammatically impossible. Jiriki notes. With that, the two teams part ways as everyone heads home to rest for the day and prepare for their diplomatic missions the next day. Shoto POV Shoto enters his home with a bit of a skip to his step, showing visible excitement when he usually isn't one to do so. As he comes to the kitchen to sit down just in time for lunch, Itasuka and Asami raise a brow at his behavior. Itasuka closes his newspaper and sets it to the side. What's got you in a good mood today? We've received a diplomatic mission. Shoto boasts. We leave tomorrow of the Hidden Dream Village, Itasuka scrunches his nose. Dot Hidden Dream? Where's that? Shoto shrugs. Somewhere east apparently. Beyond the land of Earth. So why is a team from the Leaf being sent? Asami asks from behind the kitchen counter, finishing up her cooking. And on such short notice, too. Sounds like they wanted Naruto Shisho to be their contact, so we're going with him. I suppose that's what happens when you're famous. Even if Naruto is the one they want, be sure to make a good impression. You kids' actions will reflect on him, as well. Itasuka notes. I will, father. Shoto nods. I won't bring shame to Naruto Shisho's name. Asami walks over and places a bowl in front of her husband and son. When she does, she leans down and kisses Shoto on the top of the head. Whatever you do, I'm certain Naruto wouldn't be ashamed of you. He doesn't strike me as the type. No, he probably isn't. Shoto laughs and looks down to his bowl. Is this, Maizo soup? Your favorite? She goes back to grab a bowl for herself and sits at the table with her family. Now why don't you tell us more about your mission? Yakamaru, POV. When Yakamaru comes home, he's immediately met by the sight of Yukamaru tending to the garden in front of their house, while the twins sleep in the rocking swing, after presumably a day of running around. He decides to take a detour to say hi to his adopted cousin. Hello Yoku. Yukamaru greets him with a smile. Hey. Yakamaru motions to the twins. Little ones tired out? They are. Yukimaru chuckles, spent all the energy they had. What about you, back from a mission? Back from getting one, actually. We leave tomorrow for an apparently important diplomatic mission. Yakimaru slightly lowers his gaze. Yukimaru picks up on his more guarded demeanor. You don't want to? No, I do. Yakimaru gets defensive. It's just important. I don't really know if I can really help with something like that. I'm just a kid from the slums. Hmm. I don't think that's true. We're a lot more than where we came from. By that logic, Katori is just a simple orphan, right? No, she isn't. She's a lot more than. Yakamaru stops and relaxes his tensed up muscles. Oh. See? You've changed a lot and are a person who is trusted with this kind of mission. So it's all good. Even when you don't know something, you can learn, right? I dunno. I don't think this mission is one where you have time to learn. Depends on what you're learning, right? You do your thing and Naruto will do his. Same with Katori and Shoto. Just trust in yourself, like Gurin does. Maybe. Yakamaru tries to steer the conversation to an end, not wanting to really lay out his insecurities. We'll see how the mission goes, right? Maybe it'll be fine. I think so, too. Yukimaru smiles. Katori POV As Naruto and Katori come home, he immediately heads into the living room and picks up Hiroto from the couch and snuggles up with him. Hinata chuckles from the other side of the couch, caught by surprise by her husband's sudden appearance. Welcome back, dear. Hi, mom. Katori walks in with a laugh and sit down by Hiroto's to pinch his cheek. Hey, lil guy. Back so soon? Hinata asks. I thought you had a mission today. 
We leave tomorrow for the Hidden Dream Village. Naruto nibbles on Hiroto's nose, causing the boy to grumble in response. Important diplomatic stuff. Already? She cocks her head. I thought it wouldn't be for a while. You know about the mission, mom? Katori asks. Of course I do. I'm a representative for the Shinobi Union, their request to meet Naruto went through us first. Eh? Naruto looks up over Hiroto to look at Hinata. For real? Hinata rubs his knee with an empathic smile. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you, but it had to go through Lady Tsunada's hands first before anything was revealed. Naruto leans his head back. There's a lot of things you gotta consider when you're in a leading position, huh? Things you can't even share with your family. It's like that when you're a clan head, as well, isn't it? You'll experience it a lot more when you become Hakage. She smiles. Is it really certain you're gonna be Hakage? Katori asks. Of course it is. I'm super strong, you know. Naruto boasts. Is that all it takes? She scratches her head. It's certainly a part of it. Hinata answers. But most importantly, the Hakage is someone who's garnered the trust and respect of the village, and Naruto has more than achieved that. It's when people acknowledge you that you can become Hakage. Naruto recites Itachi's words. Seems like a lot of work. Katori notes. Maybe. Naruto stands up from his lying position, still holding Hiroto by his chest. But you're already being acknowledged, aren't you? All the people you guys help on your missions are happy to see you when you walk by. Yeah, but that's like small stuff. Hinata stands from the couch and goes to sit by Katori's side, wrapping her arms around the young girl. It might feel small now, but small gestures have a way of growing into something much grander. If you say so. How about we eat? Naruto suggests. Then we can get in some last-minute training before we head out tomorrow. Sure thing. The family of four gets set around the table, with Katori sitting next to Hiroto's high chair to feed him. That night, Katori goes to bed with excitement to go on a kind of mission she'd never done before. A mission that could potentially affect the future of the shinobi world. It's a heavy mission, probably heavier than even she realizes, but she's eager to meet people from even more villages. Hidden Dreams Village in the far corners of the map, one particular village rests undisturbed from the rest of the world. Surrounded by a large and winding forest, protected from invaders, the hidden dream has always kept to itself, long ago deciding that the conflicts of the world cause too much suffering and destruction. In truth, the hidden dream's village can be considered the first hidden village, founded long before the hidden leaf, although they served very different purposes. The dream's goal was to isolate while the leaf's goal was to organize. The village system founded by the Senju and the Achiha aimed to build a system of reliability between the nations and the shinobi clans, whereas the shinobi here wanted to get as far away from any of that as possible. Of course, times change and the people must change with it. For this purpose, the heads of the three leading clans have gathered. Enzo Tenro, head of the Tenro clan, is a bulky man wearing light clothes that all shinobi of his clan wear, namely a sleeveless kimono with a tuft of black fur around his shoulders and loose pants. Yamatatsu Hirasaka, head of the Hirasaka clan, is a lithe man donned in the attire of his clan. Loose robes that cover his whole body and a mask from which only his eyes are visible. Jensui Amajiri, head of the Amajiri clan and leader of the Hidden Dreams village, is an older man clad in armor plating. Behind Jensui, standing a fair distance from him, is a man simply known as Makan. He's dressed in looser long-sleeved robes with a vest over it and wooden Jetta shoes, but the most curious feature is his mask. It bears the image of a bearded older man with an exaggerated long nose. Makin stands away from the clan heads, remaining silent as they converse. Enzo appears agitated, with his legs crossed and hand running over his chin. I still don't like the idea. He shakes his head. It's a necessity. Yamatatsu states. It's not. Enzo retorts. Surely you remember, Enzo, Jensui speaks, his words slow and calculated from age, what the purpose of the village was when it was founded. Of course I do. Enzo answers, to distance ourselves from the squabbling of the other shinobi clans, to live peacefully, not bound by the bickering of nobles. It's not a history lesson that I need, Lord Jensui, it's an explanation. The world has changed. Yamatatsu speaks. What we once sought to stay away from, the other shinobi now seek to stay away from. If we're to ever see eye to eye with them, it's now. Jensui nods. Yamatatsu speaks true. We no longer need to hide ourselves, they've shown willingness to listen. Enzo grumbles, doesn't mean I'm going to trust them. What if, Enzo glances at the quiet Makan, they learn too much about us? You may speak freely, Enzo. As my aide, Makan is well aware of the goings-on of our village. As for our secret weapon, we won't reveal our cards just yet. 
we must be sure we can trust our new friends first. If this is your decision, then I'll follow it. That's why we vote, after all. Who's coming to negotiate? The Hidden Leaf. Yamatatsu answers. Maybe a member of the Inuzuka clan will arrive. Yamatatsu chuckles lightly. That would be a reunion. Please, Enzo crosses his arms. The Tenro and the Inuzuka have had no relationship in centuries. Whatever blood bond we once had is no more. Gensui stands up and leans on the table, bringing attention to himself. Whatever the case may be, our three mighty clans founded this village with peace in mind. As long as we keep that focus in our minds, I know we can coexist with the rest of the shinobi villages. If that's what you believe, then I won't question your judgment. Enzo sighs. Either of yours. I just hope you're right. I hope so, as well. Gensui smiles and reaches over to pat the younger man on the shoulder. Enzo and Yamatatsu stand up from their seats and bow before they take their leave. Gensui turns to leave from the back entrance. As he passes, he pats Makin on the shoulder. May I leave the rest in your hands? I feel quite tired so I'll retire to my room. Of course. Makin nods. That's why I'm here. Thank you. I don't know what I'd do without you. Gensui takes his leave. Makin steps outside shortly after Gensui, leaning on the wooden railing that looks over the Amajiri clan's garden. He remains motionless for a few brief moments before turning his head to the side. Just as he does, a member of the Amajiri clan flickers by his side, kneeling and holding out a scroll. The Jinchuriki is on his way. The man reports. All is going as scheduled. Excellent. Makin takes the scroll and begins reading through it. Alert everyone. We act soon. Yes sir. The Amajiri shinobi disappears, leaving Makin alone. He takes out a small piece of paper and writes down something quick. He rolls up the paper and extends his arm. A falcon flies in from above and lands on his forearm. Makin ties the paper to its leg and sends it flying away. He chuckles under his Tengu mark. Soon this power will be ours. Out in the hidden dream itself, three young shinobi sit on a rooftop of a random high building. The architecture is more traditional in design as opposed to the more modern villages like the Hidden Leaf, although there are some clans like the Hyuga that have stuck to similar values as the Hidden Dream has. Because of its more traditional architecture, there aren't actually a lot of tall buildings for these three shinobi to sit on, although they make do. Ryuka Tenro is dressed in similar light kimono as all members of her clan, with hers being various shades of pink and red. Her wild violet hair doing its best to overtake her hapuri faceplate that covers her cheeks as well as her forehead. Taisa Amajiri is a younger boy in dark robes and red armor plates that cover his arms, chest, and legs. His short spiky hair just barely pokes out from under his helmet. Yumito Hirasaka, the oldest of the three, clad in the same loose robes as all in his clan, but with only his head covered, leaving his boyish features on display. I wonder what's gonna change. Taisa wonders. With that? Ryuka cocks her head. You know, this shinobi union thing. Taisa clarifies. Letting others enter our village. Is it gonna be a bad thing? I dunno. Ryuka shakes her head. But, like, if they're willing to talk to us that means we can be friends, right? Allies, at least. Yumito interjects. I think it's too early for friendships. No need to be a spoilsport. Ryuka pouts. It's just the truth. Yumito shrugs. Some people say they're gonna steal our jutsu. Taisa notes. But that's not true, right? Of course not. If they want to take our jutsu, then there'll be no deal. Simple, Ryuka states. Yumito scratches his head over his headdress. I don't think it's quite that simple, but still. Our fathers have surely thought this out. They wouldn't do something that endangers the village or its people. Exactly. Ryuka agrees with him. Ryuka. A very familiar deep and booming voice calls out to her. Get down from there. She looks down to see her father and Yamatatsu down on the street, looking somewhat displeased. At least Enzo is, Yamatatsu is more difficult to read with his features hidden. The three of them hop down, deciding it best not to try their luck. Hey, Dad, Uncle Yamatatsu. Ryuka greets them as if nothing had happened. Yamatatsu chuckles. It's good to see you all in high spirits. We've talked about this. Enzo crosses his arms. Don't hang out on the roof. Ryuka just stares at him with a curious look. What is it? Hangout seems a bit too modern for you. Doesn't quite sit right. Enzo sighs and ushers his daughter to walk with him. Come, let's go home. Yamatatsu turns to his son Yumito. You as well, Yumito. We've your training to continue. Is father still at home? Taisa asks. He is, yes. Enzo answers. If he isn't, Makin should know where he is. All right. Taisa nods. I'll see you guys tomorrow. He waves off his friends and heads home. 
The two families bid their own farewells and leave. Walking through the streets of the hidden dream village, Enzo and Ryuka are met by an idyllic scene. For all intents and purpose, it's a normal village full of normal people looking to make a living and support their families. Shops just like in any village, food stalls just like in any village. Walking through the streets is one of Ryuka's favorite things to do, next to probably traveling via rooftops. She loves the people and she loves learning about their days, and in turn the people love hearing about hers. One of the people she's probably closest to is someone they run into not long in their walk back home. This person is old, older than her own dad. A scruffy man who's apparently always led a modest life, never needing much more than a simple robe on his back. He always keeps to himself, living at the very edge of the village in a small house full of only the absolute basics. For some he's an enigma despite the decades he's been part of the village. He's not originally from here and was found some twenty-odd years roaming around. He's one of the very few outsiders who have ever been accepted, the other being Jensui's personal advisor Makan. Still, Ryuka enjoys his presence nonetheless. Yezu. She runs over to him just as he's buying some apples from a stall. He slowly turns around to find her already by his side, grinning up to him. Hello Lady Ryuka. Drop the lady part. She pouts. I can't very well disrespect the daughter of the Tenro clan's head, can I? Yezu chuckles. Enzo walks over and exchanges a nod with him. How are you, old man? As well as an old man can be. Yezu says. Say, I've been meaning to ask. Is it true what the people say? About us opening to the other villages. Enzo grumbles as he scratches his chin. It is, yes. You appear. Displeased? Yezu notes his demeanor. It's nothing. Enzo waves off the man's concerns. It's not something I should concern other people with. I understand. Yezu nods his head. Some matters are best left between the ones ruling. During this conversation, the group naturally begins walking down the street once Yezu pays for the apples, now speaking as they head to their respective homes. Are there a lot of secrets like that? Ryuka looks up to her dad. Enzo pats her on the head, ruffling her violet hair. You learn when you succeed me. That'll take so long, though. Ryuka complains. That could be seen as a good thing. Yezu notes. If it takes long, that means your father is in good health. That's quite the outlook. Enzo laughs. But maybe we can start easing you in a little bit, huh? He looks to his daughter. One step at a time. You'll be a beloved clan head, Lady Ryuka. The village already respects you so you have an early start. Yeah, I do, don't I? She grins. But also, drop the lady part. Perhaps one. Yezu smiles. As they reach a certain street crossing, he stops. I believe this is where we part ways. Always a pleasure to see you Yezu. Enzo nods. You, as well, Lord Enzo. Yezu nods back. We'll talk some other time, all right. Ryuka prods. Promise. With that, Enzo and Ryuka separate from Yezu, going in the opposite direction. The two have important clan matters to attend to, one being the preparation of the Hidden Leaf's arrival. It's an unprecedented time that will surely change the village. Naruto, POV Naruto looks outside the window of the inn they're staying at. The violent wind rages, sending the heavy rain flying in every direction. Trees bend under its might, any loose items that had been left unattended now fly through the streets, carried away. About a day before reaching the hidden dream village, he noticed the skies quickly turning a very dark gray. Deciding that they wouldn't be able to avoid them, he had his team take a slight detour to a nearby town, and now he's glad they did. Katori looks out the window with him, whistling at the terrifying but also slightly impressive sight. I've never seen anything like this. And I thought the hidden rain was rough. This is way worse. Yakamaru looks at the clothes they've hanged up to dry. While they did manage to avoid the brunt of it, they were still caught in the early rain, so now their clothes are all wet, while they stay in their room in more plain, everyday clothes. Yeah, some places have it rougher than others. Naruto closes the blinds and shuts the windows. It doesn't really silence the vicious howling, but at least they don't feel it. There's a light knock on the sliding door. Pardon the interruption. The hostess calls to them before she slides the door open, kneeling by it, and brings trays of food inside. Your meal is ready. Ah, thank you. Naruto, in his hunger and impatience, goes to grab the trays, but the woman lightly raises a hand to signal him to not do so. Allow me. She brings the food inside and meticulously places each tray in the center of the room, in two rows that face each other. Please enjoy. Ah, before you go. Naruto decides to ask some pertinent questions. Do you know how long the storms here usually last? The heavier storms may sometimes last up to a week before quieting down. Luckily, this one is rather mild. 
Shoto raises a brow and looks toward the window that's being thrashed by the wind. Mild? Tomorrow I predict will be clear skies. Due to the uncertainty of the weather, I would normally advise against travel, however seeing that you're shinobi, you may be able to outrun a potential second storm. Naruto folds his arm and scratches his chin. I see. We don't really get weather like this back home. Thanks. The woman bows and takes her leave. A day in this great vacation spot, huh? Shoto sighs. Anyone want to sunbathe? Naruto sits down on the ground and bumps him on the shoulder. Come on, we can have fun while we're at it. How about playing some cards? Or word games? Those are always fun. Rather not. Shoto slumps to the ground. Let's play word chain. Katori hops in place. My word is sparrow. She grabs an onigiri from the food tray in front of her. Will it be a problem that we're going to be late? Shoto asks. Katori puffs her cheeks and glares at him. You're technically following the rules, but I don't think you're actually playing. Nah, I think we're fine. We'll only arrive a day later than they expect us, shouldn't be a problem. Besides, they know what the weather's like around here, so they'll probably understand. I do hope we don't cause an incident. Yakamaru worries. It wouldn't look good if our first diplomatic mission doesn't end well. But they also probably know what the weather's like in these parts, so we got nothing to worry about. If something like this was enough to break the negotiations, then they wouldn't have extended the offer themselves, yeah? I suppose. So what's this hidden dream place even like? Katori asks. Naruto shrugs. I don't really know. The mission scroll gives the most basic info about its creation, its three founding s a pretty dry red. I hope we can make friends with them fast. Katori grins. Is that so we can beat Team 5? Yakamaru chuckles. Well, I mean, yeah. But also just to make more friends. You can never have enough friends. At some point your positivity has to run out, right? Shoto questions. Katori cackles. Never. Well, Naruto interrupts their joking around. Let's not waste our host's generous food, yeah? Naruto finally sits in front of one of the trays. We can talk about the hidden dream or play games after. With that, the four of them gather around to eat dinner and carry out the heavy storm. In the end, Naruto, Katori, and Yakamaru would end up playing games that eventually Shoto would begrudgingly join. They manage to make the best out of a lousy situation. It's a quiet and unassuming day in the Hidden Dream Village, but also a special one. Both shinobi and civilians alike are gathered en masse in the foggy streets by the village entrance in heavy anticipation. What separates this day from most others is the anxiousness from anticipating the arrival of outsiders. A team from the Hidden Leaf Village is set to arrive to negotiate, which hasn't happened in longer than anyone can remember. Their peaceful lives of being isolated from the warring outside may very well come to an end. Or they may become even more peaceful. No one knows for certain. As per the orders of Lord Jensui Amajiri, the village has been kept in immaculate condition, shops are open and fully stocked. The Hidden Dream Village is dressed to impress. Ryuka, Yamito, and Taisa have their spot picked out on one of the rooftops, where they usually hang out despite their fathers repeatedly telling them not to. For one, it can damage the tiles, but it's also just rude to climb on people's property all willy-nilly. Still, from their vantage point, they can see practically everyone and everything. People sure are antsy. Taisa notes. Is it really that big of a deal? Yamito nods. It is. For our village to break from ancient tradition like this is unheard of. I've heard some are displeased with your father for doing so. Oh. Tysa frowns and lowers his head. I know some have been kind of tense lately, but dad kept saying not to worry. Ryuka pats her friend on the back. If Lord Jensui said not to worry, then we have nothing to worry about. He knows what he's doing. That's right. Yamito says. Lord Jensui does not make rash decisions. If our fathers all came to this agreement, they must have weighed their decisions carefully. Yeah. Tysa looks up with a light smile. I guess I have a lot more to learn about all this, huh? If I'm going to one day become head of the Amajiri clan. We have all the time we need. Ryuka grins. The kids turn their attention back to the bustling streets of the Hidden Dream that await the arrival of the foreign shinobi. From the corner of his eyes, Yamito spots a presence he hadn't before. A man standing atop a nearby building just like them, although this is not someone he recognizes. The man is a bit far to clearly make out his features, but there's two distinguishing marks that truly stand. His blonde hair and his orange cloak. The man simply stands there, observing the village. Yamito nudges Taisa to get his and Ryuka's attention. Hey, who's that? He points to the man. The two turn around and furrow their brows, not recognizing him either. I don't know? Just then, the man releases his chakra, the pressure being felt by everyone in the vicinity. 
The tower he stands on cracks, any small animals unlucky enough to be near him become chittering and howling in pain. Even standing becomes a heavy burden as many civilians and shinobi drop to their knees, while the more resilient shinobi try to keep themselves, he ends it. Members of the Hirasaka clan immediately surround him, weapons drawn. You. Enzo stomps forward. Identify yourself. Naruto sneers. You don't even know? Did you seriously only now figure out I'm here? As more attention is brought to him, his features are easier to make out. His horned hidden leaf forehead protector, his blue eyes, his clothes. Are you? From the hidden leaf, Enzo notes his appearance. Why did you exert pressure on us? To see what you're made of. Naruto explains. And just as one would expect from this village of cowards and rejects, you're not worth a single shit. He hisses in disappointment. Jensui steps in front of Enzo. You best watch your tongue, boy. He warns. Or what? Naruto's laughter fills the streets with unease. You'll run away again? Hide somewhere else? He spits. Pathetic. You've no place in the shinobi union or even the shinobi world in general. What you need is to be taught a lesson. Naruto hunches over his red chakra surrounds his entire body. The Hirasaka shinobi immediately spring into action, but masses of chakra, forming in claws, reach out and grabs them, squeezing them until they stop moving. The red chakra grows more and more intense as Naruto roars, an unnerving sound that grows only fiercer as his chakra grows. Eventually, the chakra takes the form of a vicious nine-tailed fox that looms over the village. It can't be. Enzo stares at the monster with hopeless eyes. Why? Is this happening? Karama swings his tails, sweeping several buildings to the ground. The debris is sent flying over buildings, crashing into nearby structures, tearing them down. Everyone runs in a panic. Screams fill the streets. Jensui leaps up toward Karama. Enzo. Yamatatsu. He calls out to his close friends. Protect the village. Lord Jensui? Enzo looks up to him. Where are you going? To do the same. Jensui declares and sends a barrage of kunai flying at Karama, grabbing his attention. Ryuka, Taisa, and Yumito flicker by Enzo's side. Ryuka. Enzo calls out her name in surprise. You shouldn't be here. Run. But, Dad, we can help. Ryuka says. No, you can't. Leave this to Lord Jensui and save as many as you can. The more time you waste, the more people will die. Enzo looks back to the battle between Jensui and the nine-tailed fox. He, too, wants to jump in and help, but his priority right now is to save anyone who can't save themselves. Yezu. He calls the older man making his way toward them. Take the kids with you. Dad, please. Ryuka protests. I can't just leave father here. Taisa says but looking at the battle his father is engaged in, he knows there's nothing he can do. Yezu runs over to them, stopping by the kid's side. Lord Enzo, what's happening? Why's the hidden leaf attacking us? I don't know, but if anyone can stop that Naruto Uzumaki, it's Lord Jensui. Yezu freezes on hearing the name. Uzumaki? He whispers in disbelief. Go. Enzo roars and goes to help his fellow shinobi form a perimeter of defense, erecting barrier ninjutsu to stop any more destruction. Yezu and the more compassed Yumito grab Ryuka and Taisa and run back. Yamatatsu disappears to help with the evacuation. He goes through the destroyed buildings, getting out anyone who can be saved, people who are stuck or injured and unable to get out in time. Members of the Hirasaka clan in general are looking over every corner for survivors of the sudden attack. Yamatatsu bites his finger to draw blood, and after going through the necessary hand signs, slams his hand on the ground. Ninja art? Summoning, what appears from beneath the smoke are no ordinary summons. Somewhat ape-like in their appearance, these obsidian creatures have a vastly disproportionate body. Their wide torso and monstrously oversized fists seem like they shouldn't be held up by their much thinner legs, but they somehow are. Their empty demon-like faces almost look porcelain and contrast their dark bodies by being an off-white. Nuba, Yamatatsu commands his summons, help anyone in need. The Nuba scatter while Yamatatsu goes separately to cover more ground. At one building, he hears a voice. Yamatatsu, help. He turns the corner and sees Makan, Jensui's trusted advisor, holding up a fallen wall to the best of his abilities. Makan cries in pain as the weight gets him to his knee. Yamatatsu runs over and helps him lift it up. Yamatatsu's arms bulk out under his loose robes, his arms and hands becoming much larger and disproportionate to his body. With an increased strength, the wall proves much lighter. I have this, Makan. Get them out. Yamatatsu says. It's already too late for them, and for you. Makan says in a cold voice under his Tengu mask as he holds his hands in the bird hand sign. 
Before Yamatatsu can question him, he feels a sharp pain in his legs, multiple sharp objects digging into his calves, thigh, and back. Makan, what are you doing? Yamatatsu growls in pain, eliminating a threat. Makan extends an open hand. Feathers materialize around him from seemingly nowhere, fluttering toward his hand. He grabs the base of one feather as others latch onto it. With the tip of the feathers pointed downward, he now holds what resembles a saw made purely out of feathers. Yamatatsu pushes off the piece of wall he'd been holding. His body begins to morph even more, his face taking on exaggerated demon-like features, almost resembling a mask. His torso grows to match the proportions of his hammer-like arms, taking on a more obsidian coloration. Ninja art? Possession summoning? Nuba. Yamatatsu swings his massive fist, but Makan seemingly disappears from sight. As Yamatatsu hits the part of the wall that's still standing, Makan comes at him from above. The feather blade slams into his chest and sinks deep, deeper than the impact would initially suggest. It almost feels like the feathers are digging in all on their own. Yamatatsu tries to land another punch, but he already has way more wounds than he can reasonably sustain. He misses as he winces in pain. With a single bird hand sign, Makan commands the feathers to tear the man apart from within. Damn. You. Yamatatsu manages to hiss out. Yamatatsu Hirasaka falls to the ground, his body unable to take the damage. Makan stands above his fallen foe. I'm glad that worked as well as it did. Now it's all up to you. He looks towards the battle between Jensui and Karama. He looks around to ensure no one has been around to witness his betrayal. Certain it was only the two of them around, Makan goes to what appears to be a fence with several bent pointed tips. He drags it to the body of Yamatatsu to make his death look like an accidental impalement. Back at the main battle, Enzo bites his lip. Unable to take it anymore, he steps in front of the barrier. Lord Enzo, wait. One of the shinobi holding the barrier ninjutsu tries to stop him. I'm done waiting. I'm going to aid Lord Jensui. Enzo declares. His body twitches, growing buffer as he walks forward. His nails turns to claws, fur grows on his muscular body, his face taking on a canine appearance. Human beast transformation. Heavenly wolf. Enzo howls in his new form and charges forward. Jensui looks back at his leaping friend and cries out. No, it's too dangerous. We can win together, Lord Jensui. Enzo calls back. Just then, Karama proves him wrong. Gather a massive ball of sinister black chakra by his gaping maws, Karama continues to use his tails to destroy the city and ward off any attempts to interrupt him. Sensing the danger, Jensui rushes back to drag Enzo away, but he realizes it's too late for anything. He stops and faces Karama. Stand back, Enzo. He warns. I don't want you to get caught in this. Lightning crackles around his body, gathering electricity just as Karama is gathering chakra. Lightning style, Heaven Rage, a thunderstorm powerful enough to match the real thing, emanates from Jensui Amajiri's body, just as Karama fires his chakra. Jensui fires a powerful bolt of lightning, the power deafening everyone in the village and the brightness blinding them. No one really knows what happened next. It was far too bright and far too loud for anyone to make out anything. All they know is that after they regained their senses, the nine-tailed demon fox was nowhere to be seen and that Jensui Amajiri, head of the Amajiri clan and leader of the Hidden Dream Village, had died in battle. Currently Enzo Tenro is overseeing the rescue efforts, trying to identify all the fallen, to take care of the survivors, to assess the damages. With the passing of Jensui and the disappearance of Yamatatsu, it all falls on him. He enters a building on the edge of the village that's being used as a temporary relief center, since the actual medical facilities were caught in the Nine Tails rampage. There, his daughter Ryuka and Jensui's son Taisa are helping treat the injured. Enzo's heart breaks every time he sees the young boy. He quietly walks over to him, going through the motions with a blank stare. Taisa, you should go rest. Enzo says with a hoarse voice, his own emotions still not fully in check. Taisa sniffs and wipes his eyes with his sleeves. I have to help. Enzo kneels down and grabs the boy's shoulder. I know you're hurting, son. You don't have to push yourself, take time to process it, to cry, to scream. Anything? With a trembling hand, Tysa pats Enzo's. Please, uncle. I need to do this. He looks up to him with a pained smile. All right. Enzo nods and hugs the boy before turning his attention to the rest of the injured. At this point, Yamito and Yezu walk into the room, both carrying more injured. We need two beds. Yezu calls out to the medics who lead them to available beds. Enzo walks over and helps get them comfortably on them. Thank you for your aid, Yezu. It's the least I can do. Yezu nods. Have you? 
Enzo apprehensively looks back to Yamito from the corner of his eye. Have you found? No. Yezu answers, knowing full well what he wanted to ask. Yamito grips the edge of the bed. He's out there somewhere. I know it. Lord Enzo? Makin enters the room, as well. We found. He stops when he sees Yumito standing in the room. Yes, Makin? Enzo motions for him to continue. Is it my dad? Yumito rushes over to Makin, grabbing the man by the shoulder in a desperate plea. Did you find him? Where is he? Makin lowers his head, his expression completely unreadable because of his Tengu mask, but his body language says it all. I'm sorry. Yumito crumples to the ground. Ryuka slowly makes her way toward him, not knowing what words she can give to her childhood friend at this time. Yumito? Taisa makes his way to him and pulls him into a hug, the two consoling each other over the loss of their fathers. The two shed uncontrollable tears, unable to do anything else besides curse the one responsible. Enzo walks over to Makin and pulls him to the side, away from the morning boys. What happened? I'm not sure. Makin answers. We found him buried under rubble, impaled by a fence. Most of his body was crushed. Yumito tries to find his voice through his tears. I need to see him. I don't think that's a good idea. Enzo shakes his head. Let the medics tend to him first. Please, Uncle Enzo. This is something I have to do. You kids are really something else. Enzo sighs. Makin, would you please accompany them? Of course. Makin nods. He leans down and helps Yumito and Taisa up. Let's go. Ryuka runs over and grabs both of their arms, pulling them as close to her as possible. I'm coming, too. Yumito looks down with a very light smile. Thanks. As Makin escorts the three of them outside, Enzo grunts in frustration. He stomps out of the room and onto the balcony, where he slams his fist on the railing with as much force as he can. Yezu walks over to him and leans on the railing. Lord Enzo? Damn the hidden leaf. Enzo curses through gritted teeth. If this shinobi union thinks it can bend us to their will, they're sorely mistaken. Sir, about the Nine Tails host. You said his name was. Naruto Uzumaki. Enzo breathes in. You're not an active shinobi so I guess you never needed to know. He's the Leafs Jinchuriki. Supposedly a hero from the war five years ago that left the whole world in ruins. Guess he's only a hero to the fucking great nations. But, if he's an Uzumaki, I don't see why he'd do this. The Uzumaki clan would never stoop to doing something like this. Yezu says with a hint of desperation in his voice. Surely there has to be something more to this. We all saw what happened, Yezu. The hidden leaf attacked us, and they didn't even care to hide it. If they think this is enough to scare us, they're sorely mistaken. Enzo growls. I'm just not certain about it, sir. Why are you so quick to defend someone who destroyed your home? Enzo snaps. Or do you know something we don't, Yezu? He gets close to the older man, staring daggers into him. No, sir. Yezu looks away. I just don't want to believe they do something like this. Seeing is believing, isn't it? Enzo steps away. The hidden leaf initiated a war, and I intend to retaliate. He growls. End of chapter 67. Name meanings. Yamatatsu Hirasaka. Just like his game canon son, Yamito Hirasaka, he's named after the Yamatsu Hirasaka from Shinto mythology. The mountain slope that descends to Yomi, the underworld. Makan, bird of prey. Yezu. Named after Yezu City in Shizuoka Prefecture. Shisho. Equals Master. Trivia. The Hidden Dreams Village is a game-only village from Naruto Shippuden. Kazuna Drive, while the Hidden Moon Village was featured in the game, Naruto Shippuden. Ultimate Ninja Heroes 3. I'll be honest, I'm going to basically rip off those games with the next two arcs. Chapter 68. Hidden Dream Part 2. Familial Bonds. With the Hidden Dream Village partially in ruins, everyone was scurrying about in a panicked state over the loss of their leaders. Enzo Tenro's decisiveness got everyone under control. With him in charge of protecting the survivors and the injured, and Makin in charge of scouting the woods for the Nine Tails Jinchuriki or any other attackers, the village is secure. Unfortunately for Enzo, he doesn't know how misplaced his trust is. Makin has set up a rotation of skilled shinobi primarily from the Amajiri clan, what would be the equivalent of other villages' Anbu. Their stealth movements would normally be indecipherable as they stick to the shadows and keep their patterns seemingly random. However, a trained eye can decipher their movements. Someone who'd spent years in hiding from Anbu and trained assassins can read them like a book. 
Yezu didn't have a reason to suspect foul play on anyone's part, but living on the very edge of town means that he catches the occasional glimpse of Makan's groups leaving and entering the village. They're trained well enough and do their jobs well, but Yezu is better. For him it starts off as just a gut feeling that led to him making note of when they leave, how many leave, and for how long. It's weird. Yezu muses, doing his best not to alert Makan's people that he's well aware of their presence. These rotations don't sit well with me. They're too short to be tracking the attacker, and they're hardly enough to act as a defense. Years of experience mean that he's gotten to know many special task forces over the years. He knows how they act in a given situation, and these shinobi aren't acting appropriately. He walks back into his tiny abode to give the appearance of a man going home to rest. However, once he knows there are no prying eyes, he flickers out the window and into the forest. Naruto, POV Naruto breathes in the fresh air and exhales deeply. Despite the forest in front of them having a somewhat gloomy appearance, what with being covered in fog, there's still a certain freshness to it that's difficult to deny. The air just hits different here compared to back home. So this is the forest? Shoto asks. Doesn't look like much. Well, it's a genjutsu-inducing forest. Most genjutsu are meant to look unassuming, so you'd fall for it. True enough. Yakamaru eyes the forest with suspicion. Are we actually going to be okay here? Sure we are. Naruto grins. Mission Scroll gave us exact instructions where to wait for a rescort, we're safe here. Then someone will safely guide us through it. So we're like on the edge? Katori waves her hands in front of her with great speed, her efforts to blow the fog away proving unsuccessful. If we take one step closer, we'll fall under a genjutsu? Well it's not that severe. Naruto's voice breaks into the beginning of a laugh until he realizes he's not actually certain. It isn't, right? You tell us, dad. Katori cocks her head. Hey, I'm sure it'll be fine. He waves it off. Scroll says we're safe from the genjutsu, so we're good. Also, we're on official business here, so call me sensei. Team 9 make themselves comfortable at their designated spot, waiting for whoever is meant to escort them to the hidden dream. Naruto sits down on a rock and looks into the forest, looking for any signs of movement, while the kids entertain themselves as best they can. Shoto kneels on the grass to meditate, while Katori and Yakamaru calmly throw a kunai between each other, in the absence of something more normal like a ball. I wonder what the people here are like? Katori muses as she passes the kunai to Yakamaru. I hope we can be friends. I hope so, too. Yakamaru catches the kunai by its hook and throws it back with a bit of a flourish. They must want to be if they called us? Yeah, exactly. They'll be friendly, and we'll become pals real quick. Katori flashes a grin or they could be hardasses who don't like anyone. Shoto chimes in from his meditation spot. In that case, you'll get along great. Katori chuckles. Shoto slowly opens his eyes, taking her words into consideration. You're right. We'll bond over how stubborn we are while ignoring and isolating you. Katori drops her kunai in shock, her mouth agape. You wouldn't do that. Dad sensei, tell him he can't do that. From his spot of looking into the forest, Naruto laughs, having been listening to their bickering. Nah, I'm staying out of this one. Katori glares and puffs out her cheeks at an amused Shoto who returns to his meditation. As they continue to wait for a few more minutes, a sudden tiredness hits all of them. The kids lie down on the ground barely able to keep their eyes open. Guess I was more tired than I thought. Yakamaru yawns. Where are they taking so long? Come on, now. Naruto sighs and stands up to his feet. We gotta make sure we're presentable, you know? Can't have them. See us. He drops to one knee. Like this? Dad? Katori tries to stand up but finds herself unable to. She falls to the ground and not even a second later, falls asleep along with Yakamaru and Shoto. Naruto tries to focus his eyes on the kids, but his dizziness makes that a difficult task. This? Isn't normal. The forms the hand sign to summon his shadow clones. Is it? The forest? Before he can mold any of his chakra, he crumples to the ground, unconscious. Oi. A loud voice booms from within his mindscape. What do you think you're doing getting caught by a genjutsu? Karama looms over Naruto's passed out body and lets out an exasperated sigh. What a rookie mistake to not notice. Well, it's a good thing for you a jinchuriki isn't that easily held by such simple tricks. As Karama brings out a single claw in an attempt to jostle Naruto awake, he finds himself unable to find Naruto. Just as he's about to to disrupt Naruto's chakra and break him free of the illusion, a fog surrounds both of them and hides Naruto's body from sight. What? 
Kurama frantically searches for Naruto within the fog but is unable to find him, even though he knows exactly where he was just lying on the ground. Kurama looks around in a mild panic, having never experienced something like this. For a free-tailed beast to be unable to interact with their own host. Whatever's happening is beyond anything he's seen before. When he looks up at the increasing fog, it morphs its appearance. It unnoticeable at first, but as more fog gathers, it takes on some very clear characteristics. A quadrupedal form, long tail swishing behind its body. A canine snout inching closer to Kurama whose eyes widen at the realization of what this may be. No. Kurama growls. It can't be you. You should be locked away with the rest of them. He swings his tails with as much power as he can to blow away the fog, but it's persistent. It remains in place with still no sight of Naruto. Meanwhile, out in the real world, a single person approaches Team 9. They step out of the forest and move toward the unconscious forms of the Leaf Shinobi. Hidden Dream Village It hasn't been the greatest day for Makan. There was a plan and it was meant to be executed on time. Naruto Uzumaki was definitely meant to arrive yesterday, the report said he was making good time on his travel, and yet he's nowhere to be seen. It was supposed to go swimmingly and yet, Lord Makan, a member of the Amajiri clan flickers behind him and kneels. I swear, if you tell me one more time you've not found him. Makan hisses from beneath his Tengu mask. The woman stammers and looks away. Makan slams his fists on the table. Don't come to me unless you have any actual news. We need the Jinchuriki here to continue our plans, but if he's nowhere to be seen, that gives time for emotions to cool. Thinking isn't Enzo Tenro's strong suit, but given the time, even he might start doing it. We, um, did find out the reason for his absence. She says while looking at the ground, fearful of meeting Makin's gaze. Or him meeting hers, since she wouldn't be able to see him from that damn mask. There was a heavy thunderstorm during the last leg of his journey. That was. After you recalled our men. Makin takes a step forward, stomping his foot on the ground with his wooden Jetta shoes. Are you saying this is my fault? He hisses. No. She rushes to defend herself. Not at all, sir. Merely. Giving a timeline of the events. Makin clicks his tongue. Forget it. I'll head out myself to look for him. He heads out the door and makes a sharp turn, but doesn't get that far before he hears the familiar voice of Enzo. Makin. Enzo walks up to him. Have you received any news? Makin sighs to himself, disgruntled at the continued interruptions. No, sir. He turns around to greet Enzo. No sign of the Jinchuriki, but our scouts are prepared for further attacks. Good. We'll not be made fools of a second time. No, we will not. Will you walk with me, Makin? I'd like your opinion on something. With the Amajiri and Hirasaka clans still reeling from their loss, we're the only ones remaining to ensure our village doesn't fall. Damn it, more interruptions. Makin feels like hitting something, or someone, in his frustration but can't afford to right now. Of course. Lead the way. Honestly, I also worry for poor Tysev and Yumito. Enzo admits. The boys have had a rough couple of days, and I don't think they're coping well. It's understandable, given everything that happened. To lose their fathers so suddenly at the hands of the treacherous shinobi union. They received a harsh lesson that they did not deserve. Ryuka says they've been pulling away and becoming distant. I worry they might do something rash, such as try and take matters into their own hands. Enzo sighs. I know you have a lot on your plate already, but. Makin nods. I'll have my people keep an eye out for them. In case they wander off. Thank you. Enzo clasps him on the shoulder. I'm glad to still have you, Makin. And I, you, Enzo. You don't know how valuable your presence is. Makin says with a hidden sneer, mocking the man without his knowledge. Hide in Leaf Village. In Hakage's office, it's business as usual. A calm day of paperwork, of sun blaring through the overly large windows, of the sounds of merriment as people walk past a Hakage's tower to go about their days. It's moments like this that make the sixth Hakage, Naruto Uzumaki, happy to be alive as he looks out the windows. Lord Sixth. Shikamaru enters the office. The guests are here. Naruto winces and swerves around in his chair. I told you there's no need to be that formal, Shikamaru least of all when it's just us. That won't do. You're the Hakage, I can't treat you as anything less. Shikamaru gives a teasing wink. Come on, they're waiting for us. Naruto sighs and pushes himself off his chair. If I'm the Hakage, shouldn't you respect my wishes or something? That's not quite how it works. Shikamaru laughs. As the two leave the room, Naruto creates five shadow clones to stay behind and tend to the unfinished work. As they walk along the corridor, he can't help but feels like something's off. 
you know, it's almost like he can hear someone very distant calling out to him. He instinctively turns around, but there's clearly no one there. Shikamaru raises a brow at the sudden stop. Something wrong? Naruto furrows his brow, thinking that maybe if he stares long enough, he'll be able to see whoever's calling his name. Nah, it's nothing. Only slightly concerned, they make their way to a meeting room, where two people are already seated. Gara and Sasuke turn and greet him with a smile. Lord Hakage. Gara stands up. It's good to see you again. Lord Kazakage. Naruto chuckles. It's been too long, brother. He walks up to him and wraps him in a tight hug. Gara awkwardly returns with a light laugh. I'll leave you to it, then. Shikamaru moves to head back out. Hey, where you going? Naruto lets go of Gara to Shikamaru. You're part of this, too, so sit down. You could use the break. Shikamaru takes a moment to consider it, stroking his chin. Maybe I could. That's the spirit. The four of them sit around the table, cups of sake filled and plates filled with dried squid for a light snack. Your kids, Gara looks at the three of them, they've already become Genin, have they not? How are they faring? It's becoming more of a drag. Shikamaru sighs. Shikasa takes more after Tamari with every passing day. Sasuke laughs. I could say the same with Kami. She has the Sharingan, but in almost every other way she's like Sakura. From the reports, that seems like a powerful combination. Shikamaru notes. That's true. What of Hirodo? Gara then turns to Naruto. Hirodo is. Naruto winces in pain. Ruto? Naruto? Sasuke places a hand on his shoulder, concerned for his friend. What's wrong? Gara asks. I don't know. Naruto rubs his temple. Something's just. Kinda off. Ruto? He crumbles to the ground, crying and convulsing in pain. Naruto? Gara pushes his chair back and kneels down to check on him. Are you okay, Naruto? Shikamaru looks him over. Sasuke tries to get him still so he doesn't hurt himself. Naruto? Naruto? Kurama's voice finally breaks through. Naruto takes in a sharp breath, and when he comes to, he finds himself in a light place, surrounded by nine tori gates. Under the gate marked with A, Shukaku looms over him, under the gate marked with U Sun Goku is leaning down as close to the ground as he can get while propping himself on his knuckles, and under the gate marked with A, Kurama gives an exasperated sigh. Finally, Kurama sits on the ground. Took you long enough to wake up. Welcome back. Sun straightens himself. Wah. Naruto looks between the three of them. What's going on? Were you two here? You got yourself caught in a nasty genjutsu. Shukaku explains. Lucky for you, your pet learned how to swallow his pride and ask for help. I didn't ask anything from you, you damn tanuki. And I'm no one's pet, you got that. You mean the genjutsu from the forest? Naruto rubs his head and gets up to his feet. If I was caught in it, why didn't you just disturb my chakra to get me out? You think I didn't try that? Kurama growls. Look, I'll explain it to you later, you got things in the real world you gotta deal with first. Right. Naruto still looks at them with confusion. You need us to come? Sun asks. In case things go south. Kurama shakes his head. I don't think that'll be needed. I still don't know if that thing actually is around or not. If it is, I'll call you. Swallowing your pride twice in a day? How rare. Shukaku laughs. I sure hope you're good at explaining. Naruto shakes his head. What about the kids? What happened to them? You'll see in a second. Ending their conversation, the three-tailed beasts knock Naruto out of their shared consciousness. He jostles awake on the cold ground of a dark and damp place. Yakamaru, POV. As soon as the academy bell rings, Yakamaru just tosses all his belongings in his backpack and makes a run for it. Hey, where are you going? Katori calls out to him. Yakamaru stops at the door and proceeds to run in place, sorry, guys, we'll train later, okay, before zooming out. With the eagerness of a puppy and the dexterity of a cat, he takes to the rooftops for maximum efficiency. Deftly jumping over the streets of the hidden leaf, he makes it back home in record time. The two joined houses, much bigger than the simple shack that used to live in. He walks in through the unlocked front door and heads straight for the living room where from the back of the couch, he sees two familiar heads of hair. The long silver hair of his mother Yoi and the short blue hair of his father Ku. Hey, champ. Ku turns around to greet his son. Yakamaru grins and jumps over the couch to sit right next to them. Hey, dad, mom. Yoi chuckles at his display. What have we said about jumping the couch, Yoku? Sorry, mom. He rubs the back of his neck. Ah, it's all right. Ku ruffles his hair and pulls him into a hug. It's good to be energetic. How about we practice some crystal style after this? Sure. 
Yakamaru snuggles close. You're too soft on him, you know. Yue reprimands her husband, but her laugh betrays her tone. She snuggles with Ku and Yakamaru. That's because I love you both so much. Ku grins. Love you, too, dad. At this point, the front door creaks open. It's not exactly an usual sound, as Gurin and her family often drop by to visit, make it a family event. Yoi, I'm home. The older male voice that calls out is very much not Gurin's or Gozu's or Yukimaru's. Tiuchi walks into the room with an unassuming and cheerful demeanor, whistling a tune. When he spots Ku sitting on the couch, he drops the bag of groceries he's holding. Who? Are you? Tiuchi furrows his brow. Who am I? Ku stands up from the couch, pulling himself away from Yakamaru and Yoi. Who are you? They both inch closer to each other, taking slow and calculated steps. Dad, no. Yakamaru clings to his father's arm. This is Tiuchi. He's. Uh, he's. He's what, Yoku? Ku glares down. What is he? Yakamaru frantically looks between the two of them, his breathing becoming shallower and his eyes getting foggier. Yakamaru, Tiuchi turns to him, tell this man he needs to leave. He doesn't belong here. No. He does. He's. He's my dad. That's right. Ku growls. You leave. No. Yakamaru shouts. It's. You're. He takes a step back. Mom? Yoi remains unmoving on the couch, staring into the wall with a completely empty expression. Yoku. Ku steps toward him. Yakamaru. Tiuchi steps toward him. They both demand in unison. Tell him he needs to leave. No. He screams at the top of his lungs, louder than he's ever screamed before, more afraid than he's ever been before. He takes another step back and his leg catches on the carpet, causing him to fall on his back as he screams in a panic. He jostles awake from the impact, on the cold ground of a dark and damp place. Katori POV Sitting cross-legged in the middle of a field, Katori meditates. She has her hands in a bird hand sign, molding her chakra to the point where it's creating a visible layer over her body. Without making any additional movements, the area around her is filled with large black feathers, which join to form a whole flock of condors, each of them as large as a horse. They fly up to join hundreds of other overly large birds, ranging from sparrows to parrots to hawks. Each of them part of a large flock and practically blanketing the sky above her to block the sun from fully shining. That's amazing, Katori. Naruto walks up to her as he claps. She turns around with a wide grin. Isn't it? She floats up in the air from her sitting position. I've already mastered it all. Hinata smiles warmly and extends her hands to Katori. Yes, you have. We're so proud of you. Katori flies toward Hinata and hugs her tightly. It's all thanks to you. It's all thanks to how strong you've become. Hinata brushes her hair as they embrace. And we have a special surprise for you. Naruto leans forward with a grin. You do? Katori gasps in surprise. MHM. Come with us. Naruto begins walking away, motioning for them to follow. Hinata and Katori go hand in hand with Katori still flying through the air. As they catch up, Katori takes Naruto's other hand. He doesn't lead her too far away, just a short walk through the nearby forest which leads to a different clearing. There, she sees two unknown to her figures, a man and a woman, but she's most shocked to see a figure that is known to her. The woman who raised Katori along with the rest of the kids at the Kusatsu orphanage. Ms. Shina. Katori flies up to her in a rush and wraps her in a big hug. What are you doing here? Why, I'm here for your surprise, of course. Shina says with a laugh. Katori, she pulls away from the hug and motions to the people standing next to her. Meet your parents. My. Parents? Katori furrows her brow. That's right. The man steps forward. We've been looking for you for a long time, Katori. And now we can be a family again. But. She frantically looks back to Naruto and Hinata who are gradually stepping back. I I already. Have a family. Don't be silly, dear. The woman walks up to her. You're a Hoyoku. Katori floats back. But. No, I'm. I'm an Uzumaki. You don't have to be any longer. Naruto says. You can be with your real family now. He walks away with Hinata. But if you don't want us, then. The man and woman turn around and walk away, as well. No, wait. Katori looks between the two couples, each getting smaller as they walk into the distance and leave her behind. No, please don't leave. She floats toward her birth parents, but a nagging at the back of head tells her to go the other way. In a panic, she turns around and begins floating to her adoptive parents. She goes back and forth, tears rolling down her eyes, until she finally breaks and falls to the ground. She jostles awake on the cold ground of a dark and damp place. Shoto POV 
Shoto looks around at the packed arena, everyone cheering and yelling at the top of their lungs in anticipation for the bout to come. He takes a deep breath, taking the time to admire the overwhelming atmosphere. After a moment of silent contemplation, he takes his battle stance, prepared to face his foe. Juriki slowly walks out in the arena to take his position opposite of Shoto. Once the audience calms their cheering, the two lunge at each other and exchange vicious blows. Shoto's skin gradually turns dark brown, hardening under the effect of his earth spear. His strikes become stronger with the enhancement, while Juriki's become weaker from injuring himself on Shoto's stone-like skin. Even when Juriki tries to pierce through with 64 palms, there's no reaction. Shoto's fierce assault continues uninterrupted, his chakra points untouched due to the protection of his earth style. The fight continues in Shoto's favor as he pushes Juriki back further and further, forcing him to go on the defensive. Unfortunately for him, there's little he can do to defend against Shoto. With one final solid punch, Juriki falls to the ground. Shoto is declared the winner, and the crowd once again explodes with a standing ovation. As Juriki is carried out by the medical team, a wave of people descend into the arena to congratulate him. With Itasuka and Asami at the front, almost the entirety of the Teshin clan join him, all of his cousins, uncles, and aunts beaming from joy. Congratulations, Shoto. Itasuka clasps his shoulder. You've brought great honor to the clan. The clan head, Soken, and his son, Nabe, step forward and bow deeply. The Teshin clan owes you a great debt. No longer will we be known as the clan who quit. From this day forth, we're shinobi once more. Every member of the clan bows to Shoto. Thank you. Shoto bows to them in return. From the stands, more specifically the Kage's box, the elderly third Tsuchi Kage Anoki gently floats to him. You've demonstrated great ability, young Shoto. Far greater than anything I ever expected. He solemnly lowers his head. When the Teshin clan fell, I stood by and did nothing. I tried to analyze what happened from all sides, a habit that earned me the nickname Fence Sitter. However, Anoki raises his voice. I see where I've erred and how I've wronged your legacy. Please, Lord Teshin, forgive this old fool. He bows, as well. Your apology is accepted, Lord Third. In a way, I owe you my gratitude. It's because of where I am right now that I was able to rise to heights that may have been otherwise unachievable. Shoto looks to the stands, finding where his sensei, Naruto and Hinata, are, both looking down to him with proud smiles. Shoto nods to the Tsuchi Kage and the Teshin clan, and takes his leave from the arena. The cheers intensify once more, particularly on the side where he's headed. There, by the opening, Katori and Yakamaru wait for him. You were awesome, Shoto. Katori beams. Yeah. Yakamaru gives a bright smile. You really showed them what you're made of. Shoto stifles a chuckle. I just did what I had to. Nothing more, nothing less. He pats them both on the back and leads them further inside, away from prying eyes. As he does, however, he feels a sharp pain in the back of his head. He reaches over to apply pressure and find the source of it, but doesn't manage to. Is it from Juriki's strikes? Well, whatever. Another sharp strike of pain. He falls to his knees. Shoto? Katori kneels down to check up on him. Were you hurt? Yakamaru activates his mystical palm to tend to his injuries. Shoto groans. I don't know. It just hit me all of a sudden. Another sharp strike. Shoto curls up in a ball, unable to endure the head-splitting pain he's feeling. When he opens his eyes, he finds himself on the cold floor of a dark and damp place. Completely and utterly confused, Shoto looks around at his surroundings, or as much of them as he can make out. For some reason he's now in a cave of some kind, with an old man he's never seen before kneeling next to him, dressed in shabby robes and his face covered in an unkept beard, and Naruto stood right behind him. Katori and Yakamaru are sitting a bit to the side, with their backs against the cave wall and hugging their knees. The sound of rumbling echoes through their little cave. Are you okay? Naruto leans down and places a hand on the boy's shoulder. I, I think so? What just happened? Was I asleep? He slowly straightens himself up to sit. Naruto rubs his back. Take it easy Shoto. In a way, you were. The old man answers. You got caught in a powerful genjutsu. It took me a while to wake you all up. You in particular. Sorry, who are you? Shoto asks. My name's Yezu and I'm from the Hidden Dream Village. Yezu introduces himself. So, Naruto crosses his arms, you said you'd wait until we're all awake to answer our questions. I really hope they're good answers. I think we could all use some good answers. Yezu sighs and gets up to relocate himself to a nearby rock to serve as a chair. It's been a rough few days. Shoto musters up the strength to stand up and walk over to Katori and Yakamaru. You two okay? 
He asks with concern. Yeah. Katori answers in a quiet voice, while Yakamaru just nods. Entirely unconvinced, Shoto decides not to probe any further and just sits down with them while the old man explains. Yesterday, our village was attacked. By you. Yezu decided not to beat around the bush. What? Naruto furrows his brow. That's impossible, we only just got here. And even if we hadn't, Naruto Shisho would never do that. Shoto comes to his defense. We're here for peaceful negotiations. I know that now, Yezu nods, but I know what I saw. What we all saw. It was you, clear as day, standing in the middle of the village when you turned into the Nine Tails and destroyed half the village, killing our leader Lord Jensui. That's, Naruto grips his pants. There's no way. There's gotta be some mix-up. More like a setup, I suspect. Yezu says. I had my suspicions, but they're mostly all confirmed now. He reaches over to the ground where all their items had been collected and picks up a scroll from the batch. I read through your mission report. The fact that you were specifically requested when we were told we don't know who'd be arriving, the fact that you were delayed by a day. Yeah, we ran into a big storm yesterday and had to take shelter. Naruto explains. We were supposed to get here yesterday. A thunderous boom can be heard outside, warning them that their meetings with storms have not come to an end. Also the fact you were told to stand at a dangerous spot. The genjutsu there isn't as strong as in the forest itself. It took a bit of time for you to fall to it, right? Yeah. Naruto confirms. We were there for a few minutes and then it just kinda hit us. So that's what happened, we were standing in the wrong spot? Precisely. So why did you help? Naruto asks the burning question. If you were under the belief that I attacked your village, why didn't you just deal with me then and there? Let's just say I had my reasons to believe you were innocent. Yezu decides to keep some information to himself. There were odd search patterns after the attack. It felt like our shinobi were ordered not to track someone, but to wait for someone. Odd tactic if you're supposedly chasing after the person who attacked your village. So I decided to do some snooping of my own and found you by the edge of the forest. You're saying this is an inside job? Someone from your own village faked an attack and wanted to pin it on me? That's what I now firmly believe, yes. The question now being why? Naruto. Karama calls out from their shared mindscape. Let me talk to him for a second. Uh, sure. Naruto says out loud which Yezu raises a brow at. Naruto forms his signature hand sign. Shadow clone, a single other Naruto appears in a puff of smoke, dissimilar only in his red eyes and more prominent whisker marks. Hey, kid. Karama addresses the obviously not a kid. What do you know about this genjutsu fog? Yezu remains stunned for a moment at the shift in personality. Haven't been called a kid in a long while now. He cocks his head. Are you? The nine-tailed demon fox, yeah. Rage incarnate, bringer of doom. Don't care about introductions. What's the fog's source of power? Karama? Naruto raises a brow. I don't really know, myself. Far as I know, the genjutsu fog is just present and has been for hundreds of years. I've never heard of it having any particular source. Karama growls at the lack of information. Where you asking, Karama? Naruto asks. When you were caught in it, and I couldn't snap you out right away. I felt a familiar presence, a particular chakra mixed in with the fog. This is the power of a great beast. A a great beast, here? You're saying there's one right here, after they've been silent for five years? Although if what this kid's saying is true, still not a kid, though. Yezu mumbles, then this one must have been here for a long time to feed its chakra to create this fog. One that slipped by Tamamo and wasn't sealed in the Rashomon gates. Karama dismisses the shadow clone he's inhabiting, returning his consciousness to Naruto's seal. Yezu shrugs. I don't know anything of what you've been saying. Just know that this fog puts you under an extremely powerful genjutsu that makes you live out your biggest dream, which is why the village is called the Hidden Dream. Just like the infinite Tsukiyomi, Naruto muses. That's, Katori looks up from her curled up position. That's like what happened a while ago. When the trees came up from the ground. We all had these pleasant dreams, but this one wasn't. Yeah. Yakamaru nods. This was different from back then. Then you must have experienced some kind of paradox. Yezu notes. When your brain realizes that what you want and what you have can coexist, the dream becomes a nightmare. On one hand, it's enough of a shock to your system that you could die, but on the other hand, it made you too easy to wake up, seeing as your subconsciousness doesn't want to stay there. But you said Shoto was more difficult to wake up? Naruto asks. That just means he was living out a normal dream. I was kicking Jiriki's ass. Shoto says. Katori chuckles lightly despite her lousy mood. Sounds about right. I'm assuming this Jiriki deserves it. 
Yezu laughs. I dreamt. About dad coming back. Yakamaru tries to curl up even more into a ball. I dreamt the same thing back then, too, but. Back then I didn't have Tiuchi. It was so scary, I didn't know what to do. He squeaks out through a strained voice. I'm so awful. Hey, it's all right. Naruto walks over to him and brushes his hair in comfort. It's natural to want your dad back, no matter how much time's passed or what's changed. It doesn't make you awful for loving him. But mom now has Tiuchi. I don't want to replace either of them, but. Naruto pulls him into a tight hug. It's all right. You're a good guy, Yoku. Someone awful wouldn't care this much, you know? Just remember this was all a bad dream. Just keep loving your mom and your golden. Okay? Okay. He wipes his nose with his sleeve. Shoto turns to Katori. What did you dream about? I. She averts her gaze. I don't remember. She tries not to look at anyone as to not be caught in her lie. That happens sometimes. Yezu comes in with a plausible excuse for her. Sometimes our minds can't contain our dreams and nightmares or doesn't want to. Naruto reaches over and pats her on the head while still hugging Yakamaru. You feeling okay? Yeah. Katori nods. Just a little tired. At any rate, Yezu stands up, I advise you leave. Tensions are pretty high right now in the village. Without looking back, Naruto calmly speaks. I can't do that. The people of the hidden dream believe they've been betrayed by the union. If they strike back because of this misunderstanding, it's not going to end well. And what do you propose you do? Yezu asks. I'll go in and clear everything up. They'll kill you. They'll try. Naruto looks back to Yezu from the corner of his eye. And then I'll explain what happened. That stubbornness. You almost remind me of. Yezu chuckles as he shakes his head. Never mind. Your name. It's Naruto Uzumaki, right? Of the Uzumaki clan. That's right. I'm. Technically the leader of the Uzumaki clan. He lets go of Yakamaru to stand up and scratches his head. Although Karen and Awaji are leading the clan while I'm on missions. The. Clan? Yezu furrows his brow. What do you mean? The Uzumaki are no more. Not anymore they're not. There's a whole bunch of us in the Hidden Leaf, those who have survived and come out of hiding. You don't get around much, do you, old man? I, I see. And no, I don't really get a lot of news over here. Yezu relaxes his muscles. Even old man Awa. He smiles to himself. How'd your family find their way to the Leaf? Oh, I was born in the Leaf, so I didn't really need to find my way. Although I didn't have a family growing up, my parents died when I was born. You were. Born there? Yezu looks at him with confusion. That's impossible. Unless. Do you. Know who your parents were? Of course I do. The fourth Hakage Minato Nami Kazu and Kashina Uzumaki. Yezu stares at him with his mouth agape. You're their son? No, that can't be. You know about the fourth, Gramps? Naruto chuckles. Even though you don't get news here? Yezu stiffly walks over and places both hands on Naruto's shoulders, looking like he'd seen a ghost. Naruto's eyes dart around. Um, everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. No, everything's okay. You must have. Been through a lot. I guess I have, yeah. But I don't really sweat the bad stuff, you know? Naruto grins. I have a good life now and that's all that matters. That's a good way to look at things. Yezu gives Naruto's shoulders a light squeeze before letting go and patting his arms absentmindedly. So what do we do now, Shisho? Shoto asks. You three will go back. I'll stick around and deal with this. What? Katori jumps to her feet. I'm not leaving you here, dad. That's exactly what you're doing. He kneels in front of her. Listen, guys, we're talking about an entire village that thinks I attacked them and killed their leader. This is easily an A or even S rank mission. That means it's way above anything you can handle. I'll have a shadow clone safely escort you out, but you have to promise me you'll stay away. So there's nothing we can do to help? Katori looks down at her feet. Not in this case, no. Naruto shakes his head. I'm sorry. I know this might be much to ask of you, but if you'd trust them with me, I'll lead them out. I know the way, after all. But if you go further toward the village all on your own, you'll fall to the Genjutsu again. Not a problem. Kurama huffs. I now know what I'm dealing with, so I can snap you out of it. Kurama says the fog won't be a problem anymore. If you'd escort them out, I leave them in your hands. I'm sorry to put you in such a position. I should be the one apologizing. For. A lot of things. Thank you for trusting me. Yezu bows his head. I like to think I'm a good judge of character. I know you're a good man, Yezu. Naruto claps him on the shoulder. Thank you for getting us out. We just have to be careful with scouting parties. They're getting agitated since you're so late to show up. I can probably help with that. 
Katori goes through the motions of her signature jutsu. Aviary. Sparrows, clumps of small brown feathers materialize around her, bonding together to form a flock of sparrows, the right more ginger coloration for the ones that live in this region. She's been doing her homework even while traveling. Birds? Yezu raises a brow. That's an interesting jutsu. It gets even more interesting. Naruto smiles. All right, Katori, send them away. The sparrows fly out of the cave, scattering to all directions as Katori sits back down to focus on scouting. Ninja art? All-encompassing sight. Her eyes shift to resemble her birds as her eyesight shifts between each individual sparrow. She tries to focus her full attention on the task at hand, but something keeps interfering with her. It's kinda. Hard to focus on them. Katori winces. Is it the fog? Shoto asks. The fog shouldn't be able to put them under again jutsu, since they're not living beings. Naruto surmises. Maybe not, but if they're held together through chakra, the fog can still disrupt it in its attempt to. She grunts in frustration. I lost some of them. That's fine. Naruto reassures her. Do you see anyone? Not in our immediate vicinity, no. Katori answers. I think we're safe if we go now. All right, then let's not waste any time. Yezu says. I sure hope you know what you're doing. He addresses Naruto. As do I. They quickly gather their belongings for departure, while Naruto writes a quick report on the situation. Yezu takes this time to walk to some particular spots in the cave and take off tags that have been perfectly camouflaged to match the cave. What are those? Naruto can't help but ask. Barrier tags. They hit out presence in our chakra in case of any sensors looking for us. Yezu explains. Put them up when I dragged you here. Naruto nods, impressed at his preparedness. When he finishes writing his report, he summons a toad to have it deliver the message to the leaf, in case something happens to him. The toad? Yezu raises a brow. Are you the toad sage's pupil? Naruto cocks his head. Toad sage? Oh, you mean perv I mean, Jiraiya. Yeah, he was my master. Taught me a lot of things. You know him, Gramps? Ah, uh, yeah, I know of him. He was pretty famous back in the day. You're just full of surprises, Naruto Uzumaki. You ain't seen half of it. Naruto grins. We all good? He looks around at everyone. Then let's go. Time's not on our side here. They head out to be met by heavy rainfall and a flash of light following by loud thunder. Somewhere out in the forest, there's a man in a Tengu mask grasping a fistful of sparrow feathers. Makin opens his palm to allow the feathers to scatter in the wind and battered by the rain, and disappear. Well. Isn't this surprising? As Yezu escorts the kids through the safe passages of the forest, buffeted by rainfall, there's one question burning at the back of Shoto's mind. Why are you helping us, old man? He asks directly. Shoto. Don't be rude. Katori reprimands him. I know Shisho's a good judge of character and if he says you can be trusted, I will. But there's still the question of would you do it. Shoto glares at the back of his head. Like I said, I have plenty of reasons to help. Main one being that I just want to. Whatever's happening in the hidden dream village right now is not your issue. You're just caught in the crossfires. Figure it's not fair to you kids. Right. Shoto sounds unconvinced. Thank you for doing it. Yakamaru chimes in. I know not everyone helps those in need. Maybe we should start. Yezu smiles. He turns his head back to look at Katori. You called him dad, didn't you? Aren't you a bit too old to be his daughter? Well, I'm adopted, actually. But a dad's still a dad. I see. Yezu turns his attention back to the path ahead of him. Seems like I've missed out on a lot. So many things I didn't know while I was wasting my time here, wallowing in self-pity. I hope you can forgive me, Naruto. Shoto continues to stare daggers into his back. Katori hops over next to him and elbows him. Shoto. Looks, I just. He sighs and shakes his head. Never mind. They travel for just a bit longer before reaching the very edge of the forest, around where they fell for its genjutsu. Yezu didn't really take them that far into the cave where they'd taken shelter, so getting out wasn't that great of a task. However, it's far too early to rejoice. Yezu senses something approaching their way and fast. Scatter. He gives the command for them to move. Three overly large red and orange feathers impact the ground at great speed, embedding themselves deep and cracking the surroundings. Feathers? Shoto looks at Katori. Hey, don't look at me. Scanning the area, Yezu's eyes lead him up to the skies. Look at him. High up in the skies above them, they see a man in light robes and wooden Jetta shoes, although his Tengu mask with a comically long nose is by far the most catching feature. It and the jet black wings that are keeping him in the air. Makin crosses his arms. 
Yezu. I didn't peg you for the traitorous sort. Only traitor here is you, Makam. Yezu retorts. You didn't hide your tracks well enough. If anything, you made it too obvious. Makam sighs. And yet here you are, not doing anything about it, soon to be dead. He goes through a set of hand signs that Katori's eyes widen at. A set she's far too familiar with. Aviary. Vultures. Three of the carrion birds appear by Makan's side. They release a shrill squawk that sounds more like nails on a chalkboard than any living creature. What? Katori takes a slow step backward. That's my jutsu? Makan slashes across the air, commanding his vultures to go on the offensive. They squawk once more, this time somehow even more ear-piercing. Yezu takes a stance, gathering lightning around his arms. Despite her state of confusion and panic, Katori acts almost on instinct. Aviary. Falcons. She summons two falcons from the land of wind that immediately take to the air to intercept the attacking vulture. So, Makan sneers, you're the one. Ninja art. Aerial ace. The falcons disappear from the sight, leaving behind only the faint twisted image of their forms as they zoom forward at blinding speeds. The vultures, however, are not impressed. Despite how fast the falcons are going, they easily move out of the way. One vulture catches a falcon in its large talons and crushes it back to feathers, while another vulture pecks the second falcon on the back as it flies past. The three of them continue their descent. So fast. Yakamaru slightly admires how efficient the vulture proved, but prepares his own jutsu to intercept them with. Don't bother. Yezu warns him from acting too rash. When they get close enough, Yezu jumps to intercept the birds. Even more lightning surrounding his body, he backhards one that's not fast enough to dodge. It's immediately dispersed in a clump of feathers. He grabs the second vulture by the neck and snaps it. For the third vulture, he gathers lightning to his hand and fires a bolt that hits it square in the chest. Makan forms the bird hand sign. Feather kunai barrage. All the feathers that are left over from the vultures lunge at Yezu, who's stuck in the air with little freedom to escape the barrage. He does, however, have his means to escape. By slamming his fists into each other, Yezu creates a massive thunderclap that puts even natural thunder to shame. Lightning style. Thunder wave. From the impact and the following shockwave, the feather's progress is halted and they're all blown back. As Yezu falls down, his foot touches something solid long before he should have reached the ground. Looking down, he sees a pink crystalline bridge originating from Yakamaru. Making use of the extra footing, he flickers back to their side and stares up at Makan. Makan clicks his tongue. And here I thought you're just a decrepit old fool. You may end up more annoying than you're worth. Wait. Katori calls out to the flying man. You're a Hoyoku, aren't you? I am, too. We don't have to fight. Oh, I'm well aware. Makan descend. I'm well aware of you, Katori. He hisses her name. You. Know my name? It's the only thing your parents managed to give you when they could have given you so much more. I wondered where they hid you, to think they left you with the hidden leaf. If I'd known they'd do something so annoying, I'd have killed them sooner. Katori falls to her knees, her breathing shallow. She stares up at him in disbelief. You. What? Rather than with words, Makan responds with action. Ninja art fire style? Feather kunai. Two giant feathers like the ones he initially threw at them appear by his side, with the slight difference of these ones burning hot. What rain droplets find their way to them are immediately evaporated. He sends the flaming feathers right at Katori. Yakamaru and Shoto stand in front of her, prepared to raise defenses of earth and crystal. They won't need to as Yezu has it handled. He gathers lightning chakra to her hand, his jutsu running wild in every direction. He swings his arm with as much force as he can, shooting the lightning bolt right at the feathers. Lightning style. Thunderclap arrow. The feathers get diverted and crash to the sight of them. He. He. Katori struggles to find any words. Katori, you have to snap out of it. Shoto calls out to her. This is a family matter, Yezu. Makan says with a cold voice. You step aside and I'll deal with you when your time comes. Yezu steps in front of the kids and looks back to the trembling Katori. It's exactly because it's a family matter, Makan. And when it comes to family, you're the odd one out. I might be old, but I haven't forgotten how to fight. I'll drag your bird brain down here. He glares. Well, it does seem like I might have to get serious. Maybe when you're faced by an overwhelming force, you'll rethink your stance. Makan goes through a set of seals longer than what he's used so far, and definitely longer than anything Katori has used. Large feathers of random mixtures of red, orange, and yellow float around him. They sizzle with heat, eventually bursting into flames as they join together and grow in numbers. 
more and more appear and join the piles to form the massive form of an unfamiliar bird. The fires that encompass its body grow more intense as more feathers make up its body. By the end, the creature is large enough to be confused for a tailed beast. Lost aviary. Phoenix. The phoenix spreads its wings and screeches, a stream of flame bursting from its beak. The rain around it turns to steam at the intense heat that permeates the area. Even Yezu and the kids can feel the temperature rising despite the cooling rain. While the kids stare in awe at the massive bird, Yezu remains unfazed. Maybe getting serious will be good for these old bones. He cracks his neck. Lightning flashes across the sky, shining even more light on the blazing phoenix. Even at the sight of this, you don't flinch. Makan notes. Looks like we severely underestimated you, old man. Yeah. Looks like you did. Yezu raises his lightning-enveloped arm, the crackling growing more and more intense. He sends a small bolt up in the air, and not even a moment after that, lightning strikes him from the skies. The entire area turns white as the bolt crashes right in front of them. Yakamaru and Shoto pick Katori up and drag her back as best they can, with their whole field of vision whitened from the lightning striking directly in front of them. The only thing they can make out in their temporary days in Yezu's blurry figure, hands still stretched upward, with a golden chain appearing from his back and snaking its way up his arm. Seal. Bottle lightning. With the deafening thunder that follows, the entire clearing fills with static. It takes a moment for everyone's eyes and ears to adjust to what practically amounts to being inside a thundercloud. When everything clears, Yezu stands tall, covered in crackling lightning. By his side, a lion made of pure lightning stands, small bolts of electricity bursting from its body. Around its neck is a golden chain made of pure chakra that's attached to Yezu's back. Lightning style. Thunder lion. Yakamaru stares at the man's back. That chain. Isn't it just like. Yezu roars, his voice resonating throughout the whole forest. Any animals that had remained to seek shelter from the storm flyer skitter away, recognizing a dangerous presence in their homes. I'm sorry Kashina. The lightning lion attached to his back joins him. The static that emanates from it sends a jolt through everyone's body. I didn't know. I gave up far too early. Their muscles tense up and their hairs stand on edge. Whether it's from the electricity or the recognition of a predator is difficult to say. But now I'm done giving up. This time, I'll. Yezu stomps on the ground with enough force to create a small crater. He takes a deep breath and unleashes a mighty roar. The Whirlpool's Thunder Lion, Yezu Uzumaki, returns to the battlefield. End of chapter 68. Name meaning. Yezu Uzumaki. Named after Yezu City in Shizuoka Prefecture, famous for its Narutamaki fish cakes. Whirlpool's Thunder Lion. Yuzushio no Raishi. Chapter 69. Hidden Dream Part 3. Confrontation. A woman chases after a man through a dense and winding forest, her knee-length red hair tied up in a ponytail to minimize how much it gets in her way. Uncle Yezu. Wait. She calls out to him. It's me. The man in front of her disappears from sight. She halts her movements and looks around to find him, only to be startled when someone emerges from her peripheral. Yezu apprehensively steps out, clad in his full battle-ready armor. He brushes aside his long mane and looks at her with mild suspicion. Kashina? Kashina stumbles back when she sees Yezu, her heart racing from excitement. A smile on her face, she lunges forwards and embraces him in a tight hug. I finally found you. Do you have any idea how long it took? She says with a cracking voice as her eyes begin to fog up with tears. Yezu returns the hug. That was kind of the point, little one. His own voice begins to crack through tears. He breaks away from the hug and gives her a look over, noting her leaf flak jacket and headband, and her much more grown frame. I guess I shouldn't call you that anymore, huh? Even though you still have your dad's goofy face. Kashina giggles in response. You have the same face as him. She cups his head and gives it a light squeeze. It's been so long, uncle. I'd lost hope of finding anyone. Mom, dad, I. He lowers his head. I think I'm the only one who made it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought as much. She tries her hardest not to break down in front of him. But we still have each other. You can come back to the leaf with me. Yezu shakes his head and takes a step back. You know I can't do that. There's still so much going on behind the scenes. I'm a wanted man, Kashina, there's multiple bounties on my head. If they heard the hidden leaf took in a refuge from the hidden whirlpool, it would put a major target on their backs. That's bullshit. If it'll be a problem, then I'll deal with it. I can't leave you alone, especially if you're being hunted. Yezu breaks into a fit of laughter. 
You're still the same firecracker as always, huh? Listen, I'll join you when everything dies down, okay? I promise. Just for now, I need to keep a low profile. This lion's roaring days aren't over just yet. Kashina steps toward him and presses her head against her chest. Only you could say something so corny with a straight face. He embraces her again, practically hiding her in his massive arms. I'm so happy you're safe and sound. He kisses her on the top of the head. I love you. I love you too. Another figure emerges from the shadows atop a nearby tree, keeping his distance from the two. The leaf shinobi with wild blonde hair. Kashina, they're approaching. I count at least 20. She turns to face the man with teary eyes. Uncle, this is Minato. My fiancé. Yezu eyes the young man and smirks at the name. The yellow flash of the leaf, huh? It's an honor to meet you, sir. Minato bows his head. If my pursuers are coming, you two need to go. I'll deal with them as I always do. Kashina looks up to him with a more determined and fierce expression. I'm not a little girl anymore. I can help you fight them off. If you won't come back with me, then at least let me help you this one time. Minato drops down from the tree branch he'd been perched on and walks up to them. I fear it may have been our search for you that aided them in finding you. If nothing else, it's our mess to clean up. Yezu's lips curl up in a proud smile. All right, for old time's sake. And once everything is quiet, you'll come back. That's a promise. That's a promise. Yezu Uzumaki vs. Makin Hoyoku. Makin flaps his pitch black wings and flies upward, not wanting to be anywhere near the raging electricity. He eyes Yezu and the lightning lion attached to him. The thunder lion, Yezu Uzumaki? You? He bursts into laughter. To think such a celebrity was hiding among us, disguised as an old fool. Yezu shakes his head. It was no disguise, I am an old fool. But at least I now know just how big of a fool I've been. Bigger than you probably think. The monstrous phoenix screeches, releasing a heat wave that evaporates the raindrops. The lion responds in kind with a mighty roar that electrifies the clearing. Makin summons two large feathers to his hands, gripping them by the quill. Feather blades. I've heard the stories. Makin speaks. They said that the heavens themselves dare not move near you, lest you steal their power. You were a force of nature. He adds with mock admiration. I never did like those silly stories. Yezu says. They also said you could summon an entire pack of lions to fight by your side, yet here you are, with only one. Either you believe one is enough to defeat me, or you can no longer conjure more than one. Either way, your presence is an insult. With a simple hand gesture, the phoenix extends its neck and unleashes a stream of fire. Fire style? Flame of rebirth. Yezu stays his ground in front of the kids. They're not quite out of the range yet, and they're now realizing that this battle is on a grand scale, and they need to move far away. He goes through his hand signs and takes a deep breath. When he breathes out, he releases a deafening roar that shakes the very ground. The space in front of his bends as the sound waves travel through the air. Wind style? Thunder roar. When the roar clashes with the flames, it creates a vortex that the fire cannot pass through. The flame is dispersed to the side where it can't reach Yezu or the kids. Before the fires even die down, the lightning lion jumps forward through the weakened flames and tries to latch onto Makin. Thanks to his flight, he manages to dodge in time, swinging his feather blades at the lion which isn't really affected as much as a flesh and bone target would be. Get back! Yezu calls to the kids to make use of the opening and flickers toward Makin with his enhanced speed. Team 9 the kids run as far as they can to not get caught in the two's apparent wide range of attacks. They've come to realize that Naruto fighting against a giant great beasts isn't something that normal shinobi usually deal with, but seeing Yezu and Makin duke it out, it seems that such large-scale battles aren't entirely uncommon, either. He knew my name. Katori whispers. He knew me. He said. He said. Hey. Shoto kneels down and grabs her by the shoulder. It doesn't matter what that asshole said, all right? but he knows me. He can tell me where I came from, who my family is, Katori raises her voice. The only thing he'll do is try to kill you, weren't you paying attention? Shoto matches her tone. But, Katori's entire body slumps as she's sitting on the ground, unable to gather any strength. Yakamaru walks over to her and hugs her. I'm sorry Katori. She grips onto his hoodie. Shoto sits down and sighs. That Yezu. He said he's in Yuzumaki, didn't he? I wasn't hearing things. Yakamaru shakes his head. No, he definitely said it. He's sensei's family. Then why didn't he say anything? Shoto wonders. He must have his reasons. Katori wipes her eyes. 
this day keeps getting more difficult, Yakamaru says in a discouraging voice. From their side, two figures slowly emerge from the forest, having approached them without being noticed. The kids jump in surprise, preparing for a fight just in case, as they observe two shinobi. One seemingly around their age clad in armor, and one older wearing loose robes. You don't know a thing about difficult days, Leaf. Taisa hisses. Yumito slams his hand on the ground, prompting Jutsu formula to spread from his palm. In a puff of smoke, two black ape-like beings emerge, unlike anything they've seen or heard of. Ninja art summoning? Nuba, the Nuba ominously moan as they approach Team 9. Yakamaru and Shoto take their battle stance. Yezu Uzumaki vs. Makin Hoyoku. With his enhanced speed, Yezu jumps at Moking, leaving behind him only the faint light of the electricity that surrounds his body. He goes for a punch, but it's blocked by Makin placing both his feather blades in front of him to act as a shield. The impact sends the Hoyoku back, but thanks to his flight, he regains his bearings quickly enough. The lion leaps at the opportunity, the split second where Makin is off his game, to try and shock him, but the phoenix sends its massive claw crashing down to swat it away. Yezu pulls his thunder lion back using the chain and descends to the ground. Makin readies his blades once more. He's not as strong as I thought. He may have been strong once, but time does not forgive. Yezu clenches his fist. Back in my prime that punch would have broken through and ended this. I can't afford to drag this out for too long. But that flight is annoying. The phoenix steps in front of Makin, a heavy claw digging into the ground, and breathes another sea of fire to blanket the whole area. Fire style? Flame of rebirth. Yezu manages to flicker to the side just in time and evade its area of effect. The plan being to preserve Chakra rather than using it to counter a jutsu he can instead avoid. Or so he thought. At Makin's command, the phoenix raises its giant wings while still breathing fire, the sudden movement causing the rain to be blown away, as if carried by a raging storm. Wind style? Great breakthrough. With a single swift motion, the phoenix brings its wings down to create a massive vortex that increases the size of the fire jutsu threefold. This, Yezu doesn't have time to dodge, so he instead braces himself. When the flames die down, burning trees put out by the rain, Yezu stands with his back against a tree and his arms crossed in front of him. He took some burns to his arms and legs, but was otherwise spared, thanks largely to the lightning cloak that surrounds his body. His lion stands in front of him to defend from any further attacks. Well that backfired. Yezu grunts. I need to act, but I have no idea how strong my jutsu will be after all these years. You know, Makin chuckles, for someone who was so adamant about protecting the kids, you're not doing a very good job of it. He motions to the far side of the clearing they're in, beyond the trees. Yezu turns to hear the very distinct sounds of battle and jutsu reforming the terrain. In a split second, his mind races through the possibilities. If they're being attacked, he has to go help them. In this moment of distraction, a dozen feathers come flying in from the side. Feather kunai barrage. Yezu skids to the side, dodging all of them. Is this all the great thunder lion can do? Makin mocks him. I've seen kittens with more ferocity. You're right. Yezu stomps on the ground. Maybe it's time I stop doubting myself. The positive attitude isn't going to help you, old man. I can assume you, boy, there's nothing positive about this. The lion takes a couple steps forward before its form becomes distorted, resembling more actual lightning than a lion. In a single blinding flash, the lion disappears and a lightning bolt flies directly at Makin at an intense speed. Lightning style? Lightning flash leap. Makin barely has enough time to twitch before his vision turns white from the sudden flash. He feels himself falling even though that shouldn't be possible. He has his wings. There's no way he can fall. As he regains his sight, he looks over his shoulder to see his right wing burned off and the lion latching onto the phoenix, which is violently thrashing and trying to get free while being electrocuted. That lion is bad news. It's not just Chakra that's been modified to look and feel like lightning, this is actual lightning he's commanding. As he's falling and after recovering from the initial shock, Makin molds his Chakra to fix his wings as he tumbles through the air. He manages to flap his new set of wings to straighten himself out just before he collides with the earth. His eyes immediately dart around to find where Yezu is, so he's not caught off guard finds him, already engaging the phoenix in a fight alongside his lion. Yezu delivers a flurry of punches that send the phoenix reeling, in addition to the thunder lion rending and biting it. The phoenix bats its wings and moves erratically to try and swat them away. He uses the phoenix to jump high above it and get into position. 
from the base of the chain manifesting from his body, several more appear and shoot out to surround the phoenix. Adamantine Sealing Chains The chains wrap around the phoenix wings, talons, and beak to bind it to the ground. It tries to struggle free, but it proves a fruitless effort under the Uzumaki clan's specialty sealing. I need to get this damn thing in check. I managed to get Makan only because my Thunder Lion was created with actual lightning, so it was faster. I don't know if he'll be caught off guard again. I have to act fast. As the chains tighten, lightning coursing through them thanks to their connection to the Thunder Lion, Yezu stands on top of it, prepared for Makan to have already recovered and attack him. However, no attack comes. Instead, the phoenix disappears into a clump of giant fiery feathers. To the side, Makan is finishing a long set of hand signs. Lost aviary. Phoenix. The distinct feathers of a phoenix materialize around him and form a brand new bird to fight by his side. He can just make another one. Yezu's chains loosen and return back to his body, having nothing else to latch onto. Damn it. He begins visibly panting. Such is the nature of my jutsu. I can create whatever bird I want at any time. Makan clarifies. Although the phoenix takes up a lot of my chakra and I can use any others while I have it out. Yezu growls and runs forward. This is a last-ditch effort, but it might just work. He rummages through his pockets to take out a small ball of wrapped brown cloth. When he gets close enough, he throws it to the ground, activating the smoke bomb and covering the area around him in smoke. Really? Makin hisses in disappointment. With a single flick of his wrist, the phoenix flaps its wings and easily disperses the smoke. You really have gone senile, haven't you? Makin lashes out and flies at Yezu at top speed, wielding his feather blades. Yezu runs at him, as well, his lion taking the lead to latch onto Makin, but the phoenix interjects. It sweeps the area in front of Makin with its giant talon, grabbing the lion and forcing Yezu to move out of the way. Makin runs after him and slashes away with his blades, but Yezu manages to react accordingly and dodges the attacks. Yezu tugs at his chain to use it somewhat as a shield, but he also seems intent on wrapping Makin with it, perhaps to temporarily seal him in place. Makin, however, has no desire to allow that to happen. He lets go of his feather blades and commands them to fly into the links of the chain before forming a single bird hand sign. Feather Kunai Barrage. A dozen other smaller feathers appear and also dig into the chain. With a simple command, the feathers fly upward, tugging on the chain and dragging it up with them. Yezu tries to get a grip on it, but the feathers prove stronger than anticipated. Yezu and his lion are dragged to the sky by the feathers. Fire style? Flames of rebirth. The phoenix turns to its prey and wastes no time attacking. Another large stream of fire covers the area and hits Yezu head on. There's no way he can come out unscathed this time. Or so the plan was. There's no doubt that Yezu was caught and lifted in the air. There's no doubt that he was still there when the phoenix breathed fire. And yet. From the corner of his eye, Makin sees something that causes him to flinch. Another flash of bright light. A bolt of lightning coming right at him from the ground. Lightning style. Lightning flash leap. He's hit head on by the bolt which then continues to the phoenix. This time, it's not just a wing that gets destroyed. With Makin struck directly, he loses his concentration and falls to the ground. With him no longer conscious, he loses control of his wings and phoenix, which become clumps of feathers that begin swaying to the ground. Yezu emerges from the ground, from one of the many uneven chunks of ground they'd created throughout their battle, and runs toward Makin to catch him before he hits the ground. Despite being enemies who just fought to the death, Makin has more value alive for now. It's been a while since I had to use a shadow clone. They're handier than I remember. Yezu drags Makin to a nearby tree and ties him up, so he can be taken back to the village and be questioned. Hang on, kids. I'm on my way. Meanwhile, Shoto steps up front as Yumito summons his two Nuba. Wait. We're not your enemy. Your forehead protectors say otherwise. Yumito states with a cold tone. This is all a huge misunderstanding. Yakamaru tries to interject. Sensei wasn't the one who attacked your village. That's right. Katori chimes in, still shaken up. Dad would never do such a thing. Taisa winces. Dad? So you're? The Jinchuriki's daughter? He glares at her with murderous intent. Taisa doesn't bother listening to any more before he lunges directly for Katori. Yakamaru and Shoto prepare to intercept them, but they're pushed out of the way. The two Nuba jump at Yakamaru, punching with their massive fists, while Yamito flickers right next to Shoto with a kick which gets blocked. Taisa is given the opportunity to slip past and charge directly for Katori. Katori Uzumaki vs. 
Tyson Amajiri. Katori jumps back to avoid Tyson's swift kick and skids on the ground, stopping when her back hits a boulder. Listen to us, she calls out to him. We already did that, Tyson screams. My dad, Uncle Yamatatsu, and so many more paid for it with their lives. That wasn't us. That guy's from back then, the one with the wings. It was all his doing. Tysa grits his teeth and clenches his fist. Now you're pinning it on Makan, like anyone here would believe something that's stupid. Don't think I'll go easy on you. Tysa's body begins to twitch and convulse as it undergoes a seemingly sudden transformation. His arms become longer and more pincer-like, his back becomes bigger and hunched, and a horn grows from his forehead. By the end, Tysa bears the resemblance of a humanoid rhinoceros beetle. Human beast transformation. Horned beetle. The cloth he was wearing has snapped and ripped, but certain parts of his armor have remained attached to his body. Given the Amajiri clan's special transformation, accommodations have been made for their armor, so they don't end up destroying their clothes every time they use their jutsu. He can transform? Katori silently curses. Why do we have to deal with this right now? After everything that happened, after what that guy said. Damn it. She fights back the urge to break down again. Tysa lunges forward with his horn, a light streak of lightning emanating from it. Lightning tackle. Katori dodges out of the way so that only the boulder that was behind her falls victim to the charge as it splits in half like nothing. No. I can't think like that. I have to focus, I have to get back to dad. Aviary. Ostrich. The large bird appears next to her, stomping on the ground with its clawed legs. Such a jutsu. Tysa stares with his mouth agape. You, who are you? He demands. I, I don't know anymore. Then you're just wasting my time. Tysa screams as he runs forward. Katori sends her ostrich to intercept him. Lightning tackle. Ninja art. Crushing impact. The ostrich delivers a devastating kick, but Tysa meets it with his horn. Neither of them seems to be giving way to the other in terms of strength. They both push each other away and move back to get a better position. Tysa tries to run past the obvious diversion. But the ostrich leaps with its strong legs to where he is and delivers a kick that he doesn't even dodge. He allows it to impact with his strengthened back and he skids back unharmed, hiding behind a bird. Come here and fight me, you coward. You're the one hiding behind a transformation. Katori retorts. If an outside attack isn't going to work, then this might. Aviary. Hotsen. The colorful ruffled bird screeches as it appears next to Katori and flies above the battlefield. While the ostrich keeps Tysa at bay, the Hotsen gets into position. Ninja art. Poison mist. A cloud of purple poison encompasses the area in front of the ostrich, which jumps back to avoid being caught in the middle. As the poison cloud envelops Tysa and his surroundings, Katori lies in wait. Even if his body is hardened, his insides shouldn't be. Contrary to her thinking, Tysa runs out of the poison. Not dazed, not staggering, but fully focused and charging right at her. Something like that, Tysa roars. The ostrich tries to kick him, but he grabs it by the leg and tosses it to the side. Won't work on me. Poison mist. Tysa breathes out his own green cloud of poison. He's immune to it? Katori jumps back to give herself some distance from the poison and to allow herself some time to weave the hand signs. Wind style? Breakthrough. The green mist is dispersed by the gust of wind she's breathing out, but that means she's momentarily indisposed. Tysa rushes from her side and lands a solid punch to her gut. Katori gasps in pain as she's flung away and falls on her back. She barely has a moment to regain her senses before Tysa is once again on her. She ducks and weaves through some of the punches, but is struck a few good times. However, any hits she lands don't seem to affect him as much as they shoulder. His body is definitely sturdier than average, most likely thanks to his transformation. Thankfully, she manages to find a moment where she can command her birds in peace. The ostrich runs and joins the fray, delivering a solid kick to Tysa's back. This time it seems to have more of an effect than before. Tysa grubs. It's getting through my shell. I have to get rid of this big one. At this moment, the Hotsen also flies in, but Tysa grabs it by the body and crushes it as it becomes a clump of falling feathers. Feather kunai. Before they can fall far, Katori sends them flying right into his torso where they sink in deep, cracking his armored body. The ostrich kicks him right in the chest and sends him flying away. I need to end this quick. If I use her pole of my chakra, I'll be in a bind, but it might be my best strategy. Let's finish this. Aviary. Condor. A much larger than average condor appears by her side, some errant black feathers scattering through the wind and battered by the rain. The ostrich and condor get into position, presenting danger both on land and in the skies. 
when Katori goes through the motions of a familiar jutsu that she used earlier, a wind-style jutsu. Not wanting to get blown away by it, Taisa moves away, but is surprised when the jutsu comes not from Katori, but from the condor above him. Wind style? Breakthrough. She can do that, too. As the gust of wind comes ramming him into the ground, he has to struggle a lot to move even a single arm. When the wind stops and he can finally move, he finds himself grabbed by the arm and back. The condor, having flown down immediately after the wind style ended, flies up with Taisa in tow. Let go. Taisa cries out. Katori pants and sweats from the focus required to keep up the condor. Having such a large bird is still so much of a strain. And I even had it use its jutsu. I can't hold it for much longer. Taisa channels his lightning style to his horn and thrashes around to hit the bird that's dragging him in the air. He thrusts his head back and lands a solid hit right in its chest. The condor returns to feathers and he's left to freefall to the ground where the ostrich is waiting for him. He spins around midair to position himself so that he can charge the remaining bird with his lightning tackle. Feather kunai. However, the oversized feathers he'd just created come back at him, digging into his back and cracking it even further. With his descent speed heightened and his falling position no longer under his control, there's little he can do. When he reaches the ostrich's range, it lifts its foot high and kicks him in the ribsage. Ninja art. Crushing impact. With that, Tysa's concentration is broken and he returns to normal as he slumps off the ostrich's talons and falls to the ground, completely knocked out. Shoto Teshin vs. Yamito Hirasaka With a new distraction to deal with, Shoto just has to trust that Katori will snap out of her daze to deal with the short one. In contrast, he has to deal with the annoying fast one. Their battle well underway, Shoto is having a hard time catching up with Yamito, who's proving to be annoying dexterous. Shoto is trying to land a solid puncher kick with his earth spear, but Yamito keeps moving out of the way. Equally, however, when Yamito moves to strike, Shoto swats him away with his heart and arms, making Yamito think twice about whether he wants to actually connect. He's as fast as Genzai. No, he might even be faster. You leaf will pay for mocking us. Sending mere children to attack us. Yamito hisses. You're not that older than us. And like we keep saying, we're not here to attack anyone. You'll tell your lies in front of the corpses of the people you killed. Lord Jensui, my father, everyone. Yamito jumps high in the air and reaches into his pouch. Shoto begins weaving hand signs. Unfortunately for you, I'm fine with just hitting you until you stop. You'll fail. Yamito throws kunai at Shoto, which are all dodged. However, the papers wrapped around their handles begin hissing. Shoto jumps just in time to avoid the blast from the explosive tags. Just as Yumito comes falling in front of Shoto to continue their bout, the young boy slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? Stone bamboo shoot. Twin spikes jut out from the ground behind him to impale Yumito, but he jumps over them just and Yumito closes the distance, Shoto resorts to using kicks, while he weaves hand signs in close quarters combat, but his foe proves too fast to allow him that freedom. The two exchange strikes, each hitting and misses in this intense taijutsu contest. Eventually, Shoto finds precious few seconds of freedom to mold his chakra. Earth style? Moving earth core. The ground directly under him shifts to create a square just big enough to surround him and moves downward at a great speed, taking him away from the action. How foolish. Yumito sneers. Now you're trapped. Yumito jumps after him, reading more kunai to throw. At least I didn't jump into an obvious trap. Shoto mocks him. Shoto presses him arms against the wall of his new hole, and a square of earth juts out from Yumito's side and slams into him with great force. Because of the tight space and him being mid-falling, he has no way of dodging. Shoto scoffs as the pillar of earth squashes Yumito. That was easy. His victory is, unfortunately, not long-lived as the earthen pillar begins to crack and break. Before, where stood a man dressed in Lu's robes, now stands a monster resembling the black creatures from before, the main distinguishing features being that the porcelain-like face is horned and the mane of dark red hair. Ninja art possession summoning. Nuba. Oh, great. In his new form, Yamito comes falling down prepared to strike Shoto with his massive hammer fists. Shoto thankfully is prepared for such occasions. He once again presses his hands against the earth, and this time he's the one moved aside with a pillar of earth. He finds himself back on the surface, carried by his moving earth core. He has a few moments of rest before the very distinct sound of earth and rock being shattered fill the air. The ground beneath him shakes as an eruption of earth soon follows. Yamito jumps out from the ground and approaches with a careful step before suddenly sprinting forward. 
the increased weight and force behind his fists is made obvious by the thudding sound he makes just by swinging them. Shoto sees this as a sign to get on the defensive as best he can, while trying to slither in to get a few punches himself. On his first attempt, he ducks under a punch and tries to hit Yumito in the stomach, but the older boy barely flinches. Before at least Shoto's punches were connecting and he could feel Yamito's hesitation, but now, it's like hitting a cliff. Yamito swings again and lands a hit that sends Shoto flying, despite an attempt to block it. Despite the increased size and mass, Yamito is every bit as fast as before and immediately follows Shoto. The two once again engage in Tai Jutsu with a more clear winner this time. Shoto has to do everything in his might to not get blown away. He tries to intercept one of Yamito's punches with a punk of his own but that only results in his arm getting blown back. Yumito slowly but surely gets the upper hand and leaves Shoto unable to gain any momentum. With a well-placed strike, Shoto is sent flying. Surrender. Yumito demands in a deeper, altered voice. If you do, we might find a use for your besides death. So dramatic. Shoto spits out blood and pushes himself off the ground with a pained groan. I'm not surrendering and I'm not done just yet. You're no match for my new form, you experienced it for yourself. We'll see about that in a second. Shoto begins unwrapping the bandages around his left arm. Lee Shisho, Guy Shisho, please forgive me. I know I still have a lot of training to go through, but I believe if I don't do this, I won't win. I won't be able to protect Katori and Yakamaru or Naruto Shisho. That's why I have to end this as soon as I can, one way or another. Shoto stomps on the ground, creating a small crater. He takes a deep breath and crosses his arms in front of his chest. His muscles tense, his breathing becomes even. The air around him seems to bend. The ground under his feet cracks from seemingly no stimulus. He suddenly moves with arms to his side with a force great enough to create a small sonic boom. First gate, gate of opening. Open. Shoto disappears from sight. Yumito's eyes dart around, but he doesn't see anything until it's too late. Shoto strikes him with an elbow to the back, and this time, it goes through. With this, it becomes an even fight. Yumito with his enhanced strength and speed from his new form, and Shoto with his enhanced strength and speed from opening the first of the eight gates. In some ways, they return back to square one, as both are equally able to give and take hits, except now the fight is happening at a much more intense speed. With every step they take, the ground shatters and with every punch thrown, the air rumbles. I have to finish this. Shoto fights through the intense side effects. With summoning, if the user falls, the summon creatures falls, too. If I can help Yakamaru, we can then help Katori. The main downside to Shoto's newfound strength is that he appears to be in pain, and it's increasingly difficult to hide it. The more they engage, the more clear it becomes that Shoto is at his limit. The gates are a powerful ally but a cruel one, as well. Noticing this, Yumito becomes more determined to drag out combat as long as he can and wait for Shoto to ruin himself. That is, until Shoto goes through the hand signs for stone bamboo shoots. When he slams his hands on the ground, Yumito braces himself to dodge the spikes he knows are coming. Whatever Shoto did to himself made his taijutsu better, and he doesn't want to know if it did the same to his ninjutsu. However, nothing comes. In a moment of utter confusion, Yumito doesn't sense the danger approaching. Only in the very end, he sees from his peripheral vision, two stone bamboo shoots flying right at him at great speeds. He made them behind me? No. They're the ones he made before. They hit him right in the back and send him flying off his feet forward. There, Shoto is ready to intercept him. With his right fist, Shoto aims for the chest with a standard punch palm facing downward. With his left fist, Shoto aims for the stomach palm facing upward. Two-handed strike. Yumito cries out in pain, feeling the force behind both of those simultaneous attacks. He tries in a desperate attempt to grab Shoto, but thanks to the jolt of pain in his chest and abdomen, it's easily dodged. Shoto twists his body around the massive arm and delivers a kick to the chin with his back turned. Back kick. Yumito crumbles to the ground and reverts back to his human form. Shoto quickly checks that the fight is truly over, before turning to see Katori just ending her own fight with the Taisa. He then quickly looks over to Yakamaru's fight. Yakamaru Kagatsu vs. Nuba. Yakamaru leaps back to avoid the continuous barrage of punches from both Nuba. Why did I get stuck with these two? And I don't think they're even human. During his dodging, he does manage to weave his hand signs. While in the air, crystallized six-pointed discs appear next to his head and spin violently before shooting at the Nuba. Crystal style? Crystal hexagonal shuriken. 
the shuriken impact their thick hides and they do reel back in pain when the crystals strike and shatter against their skin, but it doesn't halt their chase. Yakamaruo notes how none of their wounds bleed or exhibit any traits a living being usually would when they're injured. Does this mean they're not alive? They were summoned, but Naruto-sensei can summon toads, and they're definitely alive. So are these different? If I use my crystal style to its fullest, will I end up regretting it? When the Nuba move to attack again, Yakamaru ducks close to the ground and slams his hands on it. Crystal style? Divine pathway? Usually, with this jutsu the crystals would usually spawn from Yakamaru's position and move forward as they continuously grow in size. This time, they grow next to him. They jut out from the ground and surround him in a protective dome of crystal needles. The Nuba slam their massive fists and end up destroying a couple of the crystals, but they're only replaced by new ones. With each new crystal that appears, the Nuba find themselves ensnared with increasingly little freedom. Their arms, then their legs, then their torso. Each moment a new spike appears to hold them in place. Yakamaru steps back from the construct he just made using a little crawl space in the back he'd left open. The Nuba howl and screech, their voices resembling more ghosts than any living creature. I don't suppose this will be enough to stop you? Yakamaru wonders if he's that lucky. The Nuba's struggling increases as they try to pull themselves free. In only a matter of moments, they shatter the crystals and free their arms, which allows them to then smash the crystals around their bodies and legs. No, I guess it wouldn't be that easy. Yakamaru sighs and jumps back to gain some distance. The Nuba continue their assault and prove to be a great challenge with their numbers and strength. Fending just one of these would be wrought, but two? Shoto might be better suited in this kind of situation. Still, Yakamaru fights on, making use of his smaller frame to dodge as many attacks as he can, while trying to land a hit himself. When it becomes clear that he's out of his element, he tries to get some distance, but one of the Nuba manages to get in a hit as he dashes back. He's able to react just in time to create a barrier to protect himself, a hexagonal crystal layer that covers his arms. Crystal style? Crystal hexagonal shield. It absorbs some of the damage, but the Nuba's strength breaks it in pieces, but it does manage to fulfill its purpose. Yakamaru flies back and catches himself on his feet. Sensei told us a bit about summoning. They return to their home if they exhaust their chakra or take on too much damage, but I'm still too slow in making my crystal style as hardy as Gurren's. For now, I'll focus on maneuverability. Yakamaru moves his hands over himself in a half-circular motion, crystallizing the air. A thin ring begins to form around him. When it circles under his feet, he steps on its inside and latches onto it with his chakra. Crystal style? Crystal wheel. Yakamaru commands the wheel to spin, giving him a bit of speed, but can also function as a weapon. He rides around the battlefield while chased by the Nuba, and every time they get close, he turns the wheel around to dodge and cut them with its high-speed rotation. With the Divine Pathway, they broke it before I could harden it by adding more chakra, but with the Crystal Wheel, I can continue adding my chakra to it while also keeping my distance. As long as they don't hit it directly, I can keep hardening it until it can match their strength. It's probably my most reliable weapon in my arsenal. Prolonging the battle is currently his most secure option and possibly the best way to end this fight. Not only does his crystal wheel grow stronger, but he also gains more control over it, and it becomes much easier to evade and fight back. Whenever the Nuba comes close to try and punch him, they're met by the whirling blade that surrounds him. Each time, they get cut more and screech out in pain. This little game of catch-all comes to one of the Nuba eventually striking the wheel head-on, but it's already been hardened to such a degree that it no longer shatters or an impact. Now it can be used as a weapon against them. The wheel spins at such a great velocity that it begins to dig into the Nuba's arm as it continues to try and break through. This results in the Nuba's fist being split in half by the crystal wheel. As this is happening, the second Nuba comes in from the side to punch Yakamaru away. He manages to spin the wheel just in time to avoid being struck, but is flung away by the strength, not having been able to brace himself properly. As he gets the wheel under control, he watches the first Nuba screech in agony as it holds its damaged hand, covered in crystal flakes. It disappears in a puff of smoke. One down. The remaining Nuba rushes at him, and he decides to return it in kind. As he gets closer with his spinning blade, the Nuba extends both of its hands and instead of hitting it in the front, tries to grab it from the sides and stop it spinning that way. Its hands suffer extensive cuts, but it holds on with its huge fists as best as it can, and it seems to be working. Yakamaru's control of the spinning becomes more strained. If he doesn't do something to get it off, he just might lose his weapon. Crystal style? Divine pathway? 
he slams his hands on the ground while steel within the wheel, opting for a method that can serve as a diversion at the very least. The blue crystals appear from the ground to once again surround the Nuba and trap it in place. As more of them appear, they get in the way of its grip, and it's forced to lessen its hold on the crystal wheel. That's when Yakamaru takes advantage of a single thin strip of space he left when forming the divine pathway, just big enough for the wheel to pass through. As the Nuba is struck and cut, it screeches in pain and also disappears in a puff of smoke. Yakamaru breathes deeply and allows himself to fall to the ground, the wheel clattering next to him. He looks over just in time to see both Katori and Shoto nearly simultaneously finishing their own fights. Yezu, POV Yezu runs into the clearing, no longer connected to his thunder lion, but still covered in a cloak of lightning. He emerges from behind the trees, prepared to join any and every fight that's happening, but is surprised to see the kids standing with minor injuries, while Taisa and Yumito are tied up nearby. Yakamaru is currently tending to Shoto's injuries, running his chakra-enveloped hand over his injuries and sore spots. Are you okay? Yezu walks over to Team 9. Yeah. Katori nods. Yakamaru's a really good medic. She gives a strained grin, obvious to anyone who knows her that it's not a usual bright and cheery grin. I'm surprised to see Taisa and Yumito here, although. I guess in hindsight I shouldn't be. Yezu closes his eyes, taking in everything that this entails. You know them? Shoto asks. Yeah, they're the sons of the former village heads. Although I guess with their father's passing, they're to be the new heads. They mentioned that. Katori looks down to her feet. So what do we do now? Yakamaru asks as he finishes up Shoto's treatment. Yezu looks to the two poor boys, and then to the clearing where he just came from. I promise to take you far away from this place, but I can't just leave them here. I now know for certain that Makin was somehow involved in all this. If I can catch up to Naruto, I can help him convince Enzo. Then we'll just go back with you. Shoto states. Did you not hear that we're on the verge of a possible war? This isn't the place for Genin. Then what should we do? Run back to the leaf on our own? We'll be safe around you and we can take care of ourselves as you can see. Shoto motions to the unconscious boys. If we're on the verge of a war, then let's hurry up and stop it. Yezu growls as he considers his options. Fine. Just stay close to me. He walks over to Taisa and Yamito and grabs them under his arms to carry them away. When they leave for the clearing that Yezu fur at Makinin, they see the other man tied up against a tree. Yezu only now wonders to himself how he's going to carry three unconscious people all the way back to the village. This man. Katori slowly walks up to Makin. This man knows me. He's been looking for me. Wanted to kill me. You don't have to do this, Katori. Yakamaru says in a gentler voice. I do. She answers back. She reaches over to remove his Tengu mask. As she does, his entire body crumbles and becomes a cluster of feathers that fall to the ground. Katori jumps back in surprise. A clone. Yezu immediately begins scanning the area. When did the bastard switch? Shit, if he's going back to the village. No. Katori grabs a fistful of feathers. He had answers. He could have told me where I came from, who I am. What are you talking about? Shoto walks over and stands beside her. You're Katori Uzumaki, what more do you need to know? Have these five years meant nothing to you? Katori grits her teeth and throws the feathers at him as she stands up. What would you know? Waking up every day, asking yourself why you don't have parents, why you don't have a home like other kids. Wondering if you're ever going to have anyone who cares about you. And now you have parents and a home. Shoto remains unfazed. So there's no need to wonder about that or about the past. Shoto. Katori clenches her fist. Yakamaru takes an apprehensive step forward. Guys, please stop. That'll be enough of that. Yezu says in a much more authoritative voice. If you want to argue, you can do that later, we don't have the time right now. Before Yezu can form a more coherent plan of action, set back a bit by the absence of Makan, their little gathering is interrupted by a sudden surge of chakra. They feel a massive killing intent that sends all four of them to their knees, unable to think, barely able to breathe from fear. What? Is this? Yezu tries to fight back whatever this feeling is, but is unable to. In all my years, I've never felt anything like this. A distant but loud howl fills the air. It's not an usual sound in these parts, given that the Tenro clan oftentimes use tamed wolves to fight alongside, akin to the Inuzuka's use of ninja hounds. However, this is so much more than that. This howl fills you with a sense of dread. It awakens the most basic instinct a living creature has, survival. They immediately know that their lives are in danger. Every single ounce of their bodies is telling them to run away. This is an apex predator. 
When Yezu regains his motor functions, he sets the boys down on the ground and immediately goes for a high tree to survey the area. What he finds at the top sends a shock to his system. Down in the distance is an unfamiliar humongous canine figure, possibly larger than Makin's phoenix or even the fake nine tails that attacked the hidden dream village. Suddenly appearing next to it is another more familiar figure, glowing orange, that swishes its nine tails through the air. What's happening? Yezu whispers to himself. End of chapter 69